to also lead us in a word of prayer. I will invite Father Samuel Mwaniki of the Catholic Church. Kindly join me. And I will also invite Ramadan Shaban, the chair of the Interfaith Narok County Youth Network and Supkem Narok County. Kindly join me on stage. So let us pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of this day. We thank you for bringing us in this convening so that we set all the activities before you. We thank you for your care and your love. We thank you for the blessings that you have bestowed on us. We ask to be with us during this day. Bless our facilitators. Send the Holy Spirit to guide them. Be with us during this day. Open our minds and our hearts so that as we embrace this new gospel of Utu, we may be put it into practice. Bless our country, bless our families, and bless all activities that we do. And those who are joining us, in, uh, those who are going to join us during the day, give them also protection. Be with us during this day and send your blessings as well as your Holy Spirit. And we ask all this through Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulil Karim. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa kina adhaba nar. Rabbana takabbal minna inna ka anta samiul alim. Wa tub alayna ya maulana inna ka anta tawabu rahim. Kwa jina la mwenyezi mungu mwingi wa rehma mwenye kurehemu. Muumba wa mbingu na ardhi na vyote vilivyomo mwenye mwenye kuteremcha vitabu vyote Mwenyezi Mungu wa Abraham Musa Isa Muhammad na walimu wangu wote Tunamhimidi na kumshukuru Mwenyezi Mungu siku hii ya leo Tunamuomba Mwenyezi Mungu aweze kutupa faraja Tunamuomba Mwenyezi Mungu hii kazi ambayo tunafanya aweze kutubariki ndani yake Tunaombea taifa yetu Tunaomba Mwenyezi Mungu viongozi wetu waweze kuwapa tajriba na awape hikma. Mwenyezi Mungu mwenye kuumba mwanadamu kutokana na nafsi moja aliyetufanya tukawa makabila tofauti tofauti na akatujalia tuwe kutoka tabaka mbalimbali. Mbali. Mwenyezi Mungu tunajua yule mbora mbele yako ni ule ambaye ni mtakatifu zaidi na mwenye utu. Tunamuomba Mwenyezi Mungu aweze kujamia aweze kujalia nchi yetu ya Kenya tuwe wote ni wa Kenya wenye utu na kuhurumiana kwa jina la Mwenyezi Mungu mwingi wa rehma tunaomba na kushukuru amen thank you so much thank you we can now be seated thank you um uh, to start us off um i would like to take this moment to introduce two people um, I would like to uh, introduce our sign language interpreter. We have Miss Leonida Kaula right here. Uh, she is going to lead us through this session. And uh, David, if you don't mind, I will introduce you right now. 
please be upstanding. That is David Agondoa. He's going to be uh, also interpreting for us today. So you'll see them uh, exchanging. Thank you so much, and we are glad to have you here with us. Um, uh, for the next session, I would like to invite um, Mufasa. Yesterday, we listened and heard um, a performance from Mufasa, the poet. I think now even people who had not known who he is already know, and I'm glad that he's here with us today again. Let us give it up for Mufasa. Welcome. Good morning. Uh, give it up for Ashley. This is Ashley. Mbaluka on the guitar. What is a man without a job? How does he earn respect? How does he spend his day? Our prisons are full of broke men. Every day, our society finds new ways to break broke men, especially on social media. There's no criteria on how to bash a broke dude. Anyhow you do it would do. Anyway, a jobless man is a walking crime. I'm a poet. Poetry is how I gather people. I'm a showman. Today I'm trying to show you, man, broken things that need fixing. Say a man, the struggles of a man, the struggles of a boy in the journey to be a man. They kill men in the streets, man. Hard times do. Empty pockets do. What do you think government corruption do? It takes from the people, that's what it do. Leaves a man with nothing, and a man can't have nothing. A man with nothing is nothing. If you don't know that, then you don't know nothing. A man, a man attempted suicide, and he was beaten up. A man with no food stole food, so he was taken to jail. A man uses his bike table. Now tell that man he is lucky, he's free, and not in jail. Speaking of jail, men are dying inside. But they don't call it a grave matter unless the earth swallows you. You give yourself to the sky, you get high, but drugs just drag your pain. And pain is a tear that won't be stitched by time. I'm a poet. I'm not little, I'm a needle. I function just fine, piercing my way through the fabric of your wounds. Show me a lie, I'll show you a liar. If the rich get bail and the poor get jail, then correctional facilities will not correct poverty. It's a man's world, but that crown is prickly. Even the Son of God wept. Said I'm praying for my babies, future generation. And I'm praying for our babies, babies, future generation. Said I'm praying for my babies. Future generation said, I'm praying, I'm begging, I'm seeking, I'm hoping, I'm, I'm praying. I, 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 oh, I'm praying that. 
In a country of 50 million people, only 3 million people have formal jobs. We go to school dreaming of careers and end up in the streets looking for jobs. You tell a man, try farming on what land? In this city, you don't have ancestral land. You just have compound eyes. Use your eyes, they will tell you. It's hard to find land. Harder to find land to belong to. Hardest to thrive on a land that can't wait to bury you. I seek truth, I will not bury my head. I carry my head high above my neck of the woods. I woo history with my words. The history we are taught in school is the type you sit for during exams, not the type that makes you stand for what is right. That's right, I'm a poet. But if anybody asks for my head on a plate, then I'm John the Baptist II. Baptizing time, traveling through lies, witness to the first hand death of typewriters, serving sentences, serving a sentence, seeker of words to escape prison of the mind. If freedom was mine, I would untie the locks of a dreaded future. I would knock down oppressive systems with the hips of my shadow. We create rulers, but what we need are leaders. Be careful of social media. Be careful of the likes you give to politicians. That's how they claim they are the leaders we like. Said I'm praying that one day one day things will change and they will never never be the same said i'm praying that one day one day things will change and they will never 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 future generation and I'm praying for your babies babies future generation said I'm praying for my babies babies future generation hey. and I'm praying I'm on my knees begging I'm still believing I keep dreaming I Still praying, I keep hoping, I keep seeing, I keep dreaming. I'm praying, I'm praying, you should be praying. Things will change, so they will never, never be the same. Ashley Baluka, thank you very much. amazing wow <laughs> i feel like crying <laughs> eh? screaming shouting let's give them another round please <laughs> ashley you have a lovely voice okay thank you so um i would like us to move into the program uh today the theme as we all know is utu uh, we are still expounding on Utu. We are still speaking about Utu value leadership and just bringing our nation into this space so that then we are guided by the same values, uh, beliefs, and we can achieve the goals that we want as a country or as a nation. So today's topic or theme of the day, of uh, day two, is Utu realizing nationhood through a new social contract. All the speakers and the presenters will be directing their presentation to that theme. And I pray and hope that we will then get to get something from there. I would like to invite Helen, our moderator for this session. Um, uh, we have Helen, please join me on stage as I say a brief about you. A video right before that, please. The Let's whole issue of Utu has been pushed by the fact that we see there's a lot of anarchy in our country. We see femicide, we see people killing each other, we see lack of dignity, lack of respect, a lot of uh, governance issues like corruption, runaway corruption. We see, uh, you know, 
two sides of the coin. Some people with a lot of food and others with nothing to eat. So those kind of dynamics push us to think, really, uh, is this what an African society looks like? I don't think so. And we are thinking of how do we go back to our original self where we cared about our brothers, where we had respect for our children and our children respected us, where we had respect for life and where we were all thinking about collective um, support and promoting development collectively. So we hope that this forum will generate great ideas which we can push forward in the next three or four years in terms of, you know, setting a framework for Utu in our society. Thank you for the video. Um, I would take this opportunity to just introduce her briefly. Helen Mudora Obande is the Civic Education Manager at Uraia Trust. Uh, she has extensive experience in media sector and the NGO sector. Uh, previously, she worked for the Kenya Broadcasting Corporation as a radio host. Um, I have listened to that recording. It really sounds like someone who's done that professionally. Uh, she has also been the program officer for African Network for Prevention of Child Abuse. Um, uh, previously, the executive director, United Disabled Persons of Kenya. Also, the executive director, Association of Media Women in Kenya. And um, she's currently the civic education manager at Uraia Trust. Please, let's give it up for Helen. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that extensive introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to day two of Raya Trust convening. We are very privileged to have civil society organizations, uh, the public sector, the private sector, the religious sector, all coming together to listen, think, deliberate, discuss on this very important concept and foundation called Utu. I just wanted to congratulate um, Safa and Ashley. If I was on radio, I would have said our very own Tracy Chapman. Not so? Our very own Tracy Chapman. So I think they did a very good job and uh, we are very happy to have you with us uh, as we discuss this, this issue of Utu. I think as Uraia, we have seen that we do a lot of civic education on national values and principles. And even this morning, our director Oliver was at uh, Radio Citizen discussing the subject of Utu. Uh, where we talk a lot about accountability, transparency, and all those things. But I think, as Sheila Masinde will agree with me, probably we are starting a high notch higher. We are forgetting the basic foundation of even holding ourselves to account for our actions as, as individuals, as communities. And I think the discussions we've had this week on radio, you know, we've been asking the public, the personal things that you do, that you know are either lack of respect or lack of accountability for the work or the things that you do and things like that. Because unless we bring it back to ourselves, we will think that it's just about the other people. So this morning, I am privileged to introduce uh, Dr. Mshai Mwangola. Of course, she's been here yesterday and she started us very well. She is the Uraia board chairperson and uh, she's the performance director and storyteller. And she's done a lot on creative work. And this morning, she's looking at the concept, um, the concept of the imperative of Utu in realizing nationhood, asserting our humanity and affirming the humanity of others as a new social contract and realizing Kenya's nationhood. And uh, when we look at imperative, the word imperative just means, what do we need to do next? What do we need to do urgently? And so we are looking uh, forward to that discussion. Welcome. I would also like to call the other presenter, uh, Mr. Aoria Choka, to join me on stage so that we don't uh, lose time. 
Uh, Awori is a strategic thinker and done a lot of work on the concept and the philosophy of Utu. And today, I think, uh, based on the work that they've already gone ahead and done as a sector, the Kenya National Interface team, he's here to share with us the Utu Charter of Nationhood. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a hand for our two presenters. Uh, I want to welcome Dr. Mshai to take the stage and start. Good morning, everyone. You know, I was a little bit worried this morning because I could barely hear you singing the national anthem. Was it just you were all listening to the, you are not singing? Yeah, especially the person standing in front of us, I almost said, hey, pause, 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 why? Okay, so today you're going to see the other side of me. Yesterday you saw the chair of the board. This is the other me. And I deliberately have um, come as a thinker. Um, this is what I do. And I want to say that because I think often, because we are, most of you are civil society, we put a lot of emphasis on action, acting, 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 which is amazing and wonderful and important. But it's also important for us to invest in thinking, in thinking out our concepts, in asking ourselves, what do we mean by that? How did we get there? And because I'm a storyteller, and storytellers can, you know, if you don't time yourself, I'll be here the whole day. I am putting my, I'm timing myself, right? And I also want to wear the many hats that I wear. I'm a performance scholar. And what that simply means, when we use the word perform, we ask, how do we make meaning? To perform is to make meaning, that's the term. And a scholar simply means that we like listening to people talking and then we write it down, we, and then we sound very wise afterwards when we are citing all of them. And I want you to see that we are at work. I was really, really serious when I said, I am not sure I know what Utu means. I am not sure as Kenyans, we are agreed on what Utu means. I think many of us have ideas, perspectives, um, depending on where we come from. And, and I think the journey we are starting is a journey of conversation that I don't want us to rush. When we were sitting as Uraia and coming up, this is part, as you know, we were told. We have, then we will not want, we will not beg. And then we undertake with the primary guardians of the immense natural heritage that we have. Four years, nine, seven continues to eight. So there's a mistake. Eight should not be there. It's, it's one, whatever. We commit ourselves to live in peace, because coexistence with self with fellow citizens and so on, neighbors and brethren. We shall live and defend the spirit of our nationhood, our nationhood, and the constitution by all means and all times. What is interesting is you find a lot of this in our national anthem find them there. You find a lot of this in the preamble of our constitution. Our national anthem and the preamble of our, those two documents, if you just take them and look at them and keep reading them, they'll give you the kind of aspirations in terms of an, the kind of nation we like to be and aspire to be. Now, <coughs> finishing, um, because this is a story we are beginning, we shall go on. It's, it's, we, we have time to do a lot more. Um, sometime back in the, yeah, when we went on that journey of looking at our, our systems of governance, indigenous systems of governance, one thing we, we and, and, uh, and how we governed our lives and livelihoods, eventually we came up with a publication called OHAI, a model for sustainable livelihood and natural resource management in Africa. OHAI ran, is run out of print, but it was a time when this kind of thing was seen as uh, sedition where we are now, now that we're embarking on this journey, we'll have to republish this and make it part of the knowledge base for our thinking. Um, so I'd like to leave it there and say that uh, we have the resources to do it. The resources are in this room. The resources are you. If you embrace this philosophy, walk, take it with you, practice it, and leave it. Because what do you have to leave it? If you don't leave, what is not something you do because it's a project, 
There's nothing like a project, a, an Udu project officer. Um, if we look at uh, how we have translated spirituality or religion, uh, these days you can see where our pastors live and where us who do the tithe, where do we live? Okay, we proceed. Uh, thank you very much, uh, my dear sister Helen and uh, Dr. Mshai and uh, Awori, my brother. We've been with him in need for the last five years. We've not uh, defined it. We're just grappling. And that's why I'm, I'm happy about the two presenters that uh, nobody's attempting to define w which parts of an elephant they have touched. <laughs> so it's a wholesome animal capable of, uh, of pouncing you. So, um, j just a sm short, short issue. Um, number one, I never left civil society. Um, I was just a state officer. My job was to go and put some cops in jail for violating human dignity, which I did. I think there are about 30 and 100 plus are in court. They will still go to Kamiti or Kodiaga at some point before I grow old. So my point is very simple. We were having a chat here with my sisters here, and we're asking ourselves, what's wrong with this country? Uh, the debate of yesterday and the day before yesterday is about IEBC. You want to tell me in this house, in this room, there are no commissioners who can run an election, and they don't have to be seven. Three can run an election. Why do we have to keep on going back and forth? Our dear sister told us that if there is no political will, it doesn't matter which panel they form to pick the IBC commissioners. They will mess up like Jebukatineza and others before him. <laughs> so I don't know whether what at what at what point we will debate this because December eighth is just near and we're having by elections. We will see mess again with those four who are in office and these other who three will not have been recruited according to me. I've been a commissioner in Ipoa. It takes about six months to, to for you to be sworn in. So let's not count on anybody other than the four. And these four have a problem of collegiate responsibility. So I don't know how by elections will be held in those areas, but uh, we are looking forward to seeing. And Raya, I don't know whether you'll send monitors or whoever is in this house. We need a lot of monitors. If we want to monitor whether there is Utu in political party nominations, there is Utu in the elections, the characters who are running the elections from the secretariat to the commissioners, there must be demonstrable Utu. We, demo, we try and do a litmus paper test with the December 8th, my so, short point. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Wamahiu. Um, thank you so much. Um, I'd, like by, I'd like to start by really, really thanking the two inspiring, very inspiring uh, presenters, because what you have done is you've helped us to think together. And that is something for those of us who come from the education sector and also child protection and child rights and women's empowerment, we find our education system is not inspiring us to think together. Leave alone thinking together, it does not encourage us to think because a child who thinks in a classroom is, is uh, branded as being disruptive and is punished. So I think um, we'll have opportunity to talk later about the education sector, but the issue is how do we influence the education sector? Just changing systems of education from one to the other on paper is not going to be enough. Because we've seen those thinkers, even with 844, they're thinkers there, but not because of the education system. The thinkers, I'm sure, who will emerge from CBC, but they may not emerge because we're doing business as usual. We are saying we're catching up, we're playing the catch up game, learning loss, learning loss, but what are our children really learning? So I hope we'll have opportunity to discuss how do we influence the education sis sector to take a step back and look at also the roots. 
Um, when we talk about, uh, I think Mr. Um, Awori, he talked about the governance sector, uh, but we don't learn in the education system. Like my daughter would have been very happy to have been here today. But the thing is, she has been trying to look for indigenous flowers. She's bought books. She can't, she can't see the indigenous flowers. That what she thought were indigenous plants, not the trees, but the plants, the, the flowering plants, are actually not indigenous. And she's been asking, where do I find them? So I think these are all issues that are very much interrelated and we may not, the presenters may not be able to answer those questions fully now, but it's something we want to turn our head towards. Okay. That how do we move beyond systems, changing systems to actually doing and believing that we are getting these um, issues from out there. Those principles that indigenous education systems that we had in the indigenous systems, and when sometimes we talk about it, as Dr. Mash Mashai said, think we are mad. Why are we talking about indigenous systems? But because those are very modern principles that we think we've now gotten from the West. Thank you. So I think I'll just stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Suba Churchill. Can, can we have a mic for Suba? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Suba Churchill. Um, first of all, I want to agree with Tom Kagwe that he never left the civil society because um, state agencies in the, involved in the promotion and protection of rights are part of the wider civil society. Universities involved in research and trying to find out how effective our methodologies are, are part of the civil society, especially when they do that which uh, seeks to advance respect, promotion, and protection of rights. So Tom never left uh, the civil society. Those serving in the National Commission, the uh, National, Kenya National Commission on Human Rights are part of, of the civil society. So are those that are in the Gender and Equality Commission, the Office of the Ombudsman, so on and so forth. Those for me are part of the civil society even though of course, they are directly funded by the state. They are quasi-state agencies. But to the point that I wanted to make is that, um, you know, the moderator has talked about the Matatu culture. And uh, one of the things I do deliberately anytime I'm in the town center is to cross Tomboya Street and go to what people commonly call as uh, commercial. Because that's where the people are, and, and life is bustling. There are all manner of manners, most of them bad ones. And one of the bad manners you'll encounter, especially when you walk along um, what used to be called Accra Road, but it's now Kenneth Matiba Road, is that everybody who walks there is presumed to be a passenger. So you'll be confronted by all manner of people uh, recruiting you to board one of the shuttles. And when you tell them you're not traveling, then they assume that you are looking for a place where you want to rest. So one day I got fed up and asked that gentleman, a gentleman, what makes you, in fact, ask him in Kiswahili, hii mafikira kwamba mtu yote ambaye natembea kwa hii barabara ni bitha, wakuuzwa, ilitoka wapi. And then akaniangalia, akasema hapu kweli, now, what does that mean to this discussion? That those people who have been dehumanized out there and who objectify everybody they see on sight have a conscience, a conscience that can be pricked. And one of the things we must deliberately and purposely devise in this forum is how do we prick the conscience of those that have been lost in the wild the other side of humanity, that no longer see people in their neighborhood as human beings deserving of respect. Another respect, uh, example I want to cite, 
I'm sitting in front next to a driver and uh, I'm traveling to Nakuru and then the driver is annoyed that his conductor ameacha pesa. So when the moderator says at times they say indio musho walami to them once you pay them you are no longer a passenger. They, they, they don't even see you. They are seeing the money you will pay them. So, ni pesa. So, I engaged this driver in a conversation because he really uh, harangued the conductor. said, Kwa hivu nasema ata mimi ni mekapa karibu na mimi ni pesa tu. And they say, you know, hii kazi metuaribu sana. What does that again tell us? That the people you see out there who are dehumanized have a conscience. And I think one of the things we must again deliberately uh, device with this Utu conversation is how do we break the conscience of people at individual level, at institutional level, at small community, organized community levels, because that is to me is the pathway to enriching this Utu idea. Uh, and, and that of course is about methodology, but which of course Uraya and NEET uh, you know, can help us through. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I know we have a lady on this side. I, uh, be very brief so that we get back the answers. And then there's one last one at the end. Uh, somebody at the corner. Please just allow that because of time. But uh, you can also, no, there's somebody at the end there. And there's one lady here. So let's have the lady. I, I'm not sure I know your name. Um, my name is Webera. Good morning. Good morning. Um, good morning again. Good morning. Um, I really wanted to reflect on uh, my senior Helen Mudora's um, remarks on Utu, um, culture and how we socialize and also reflect on what Dr. Mshai Mwangola has talked about. Um, and Suba Churchill has preempted some of what I wanted to say. Um, and it's to do with we are a people because I as a human being, I'm not a human being in isolation. I'm a human being um, and I reflect humanity. And I know that because I am an activist, I am in these circles, and most of the times we condition ourselves to always fight, agitate, um, call out, see what is wrong and also call it out and also speak, raise our voices and make sure that we are heard. But in our society, um, and looking back at, uh, at a time when for two years we had to be in isolation and also be very, be very cautious of COVID, um, and the effects of COVID, um, and also make sure that our families are safe and secure and also protect our old. Um, I, I, I would love to reflect on the effects of COVID and how it has, um, it has made sure that human beings um, somehow, or how, rather the effect of COVID and how it made sure that people were isolated from each other. That, that, that the effects of that have made people, perhaps or should have made people reflect on their wellness and their self um, their self-wellness or uh, how they relate with others because when you're in a room alone with yourself and you come out in a society that has not been meeting or socializing, we no longer have barazas like we used to have a very long time ago with our chiefs, in our chiefs or we do not have safe spaces where we can meet and express and also uh, besides when we are meeting people because we are, uh, we are leaders because we also represent people in our community do we sit as activists to reflect and um, see whether we have this culture that speaks positivity out there? Um, uh, there is a verse in the Bible that says, um, let us endear to mind our business uh, and make it our mission to live a quiet life. Uh, and uh, Nairobi, or living in urban cities, has made us live very quiet lives and isolated lives. Um, if you look at our societies, Long time ago, we used to have, we never used to have gates, uh, we never used to have fences and all these things. But the more and after COVID, we have been isolated from each other. So you will find that in the ghettos, for instance, a child is playing by sewage, by our sewer, our sewer line, and someone who is a woman, someone who is a man, someone who is an adult will pass by that child because that is not their child. At what point does the society um, isolate or uh, rather create drifts? Uh, between people because of class. Thank you. That is uh, my, my reflection point. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's have the last one, and I can uh, add on what you're saying, that uh, I think since COVID, we haven't been having a lot of 
platforms where people can have a discussion. And I think this uh, convening is testament. We had... But what is this madness? When here there's Kalenjin, there's Luo, there's a Kikuyu, we are here, we are clapping together. But when it reaches at elections, there is another madness. And if you want to know that madness, can you divide the Rutol versus Rilas people here? You will see the real madness. <laughs> is it ironic? What kind of madness is this? Thank you. much. Uh, I think in, because uh, in order to try and balance, there was one question here from a lady. I don't think I will leave her. So just give her the mic. Okay, my, my name is Rahma Gulam Abbas. I'm from an organization called Muslim Women Advancement of Rights and Protection from Mombasa. Uh, thank you so much for the two presenters. Mine is where we lost Utu, it's because we let others to write our history. We let others because when you read the history book, you'll get to see that uh, we are told that so-and-so came from Germany and discovered certain mountain, came and discovered this. But there were communities living in that area before that person came. So I think one of the reflections is that we need to write our own history. And I would love if that history can be taught in schools and it can be acted upon so that our kids, when they start growing up, they get to know that it is us who are living in those communities that were discovered these things and not someone who came and saw us there. Thank you. Thank you for that reflection. There's a final lady again. And I think from what you're saying, just uh, last week I was in Tarakanidi, a place called Ntunyai, and uh, these are, there, are, there are roads which are being built in the country called Mau Mau Roads. Have you heard about them? So there's a road which is going to cross from Chuka to the other side so that it is easy. It's one, um, one of the Mau Mau Roads. And then I asked myself, what about um, the heroes that Dr. Mangola talked about? Are we going to have a Mau Mau Road in Kisi? Are we going to have a Mau Mau Road anywhere in Rift Valley? Are we going to have a Mau Mau Road in Taita Taveta, you see that kind of history is lost because we think Mau Mau is about central Kenya. So those are the things that I think we need to be bold enough to bring out even to our leaders so that they see we know where we come from. Let's have the final. Thank you very much. My name is Susan Mikalolulu. I work for participatory research and innovative programs in CIA. My question is, Coming from a background of health and what is happening in our health sector today, I'm just worried how we are going to bring the Utu in health se sector because this is now the place where we are supposed to give life. And we are campaigning there for zero deaths during deliveries. And yet we are also burning now the Linda Mama cover for the mothers. We see children die with forks in their heads. Somebody, a patient cannot afford the supplies and you reuse the, the equipment. Now, how are we, where, where has the health sector gone wrong? Is it the, the provider or is it the patient? Because there is somebody who is now desperate and cannot afford and the person who is there to give that service is also compromised and does not have what is required to give that service. How are, help, are we helping to bring in the Utu in the health sector? I'd like to give our, pan, our panelists, um, you know, 
our presenters rather to finalize their final statements and I will actually just call upon them to choose any of the emerging issues which they can address because some of it was more of input, some were more of questions, but I'd just like to give them the freedom to choose which one they would like. Let's start with Aori. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yeah, a lot of it. Yeah. Um, it's a journey. It's a conversation. We are in it together. Uh, it's a living journey. So we need to continue um, asking ourselves difficult questions, looking for answers to those difficult questions, working, working hard to get the answers. We have to work to get the answers because nobody will give us those answers. You know, one time, uh, I told you that when we published this very simple, almost harmless, literally harmless book, it was difficult to discuss this concept of Wuhan at that time because the society was so oppressive. You won't even meet to discuss this. That would have been seen as sedition one time. But what did we do? Civil society, not anybody else, civil society, we organized, worked with political actors who are also part of civil society, and changed that environment where we are today. Now, let me tell you something. Um, that's when I, uh, when I say that this room is so rich in terms of resources. I'm not looking at how much money is in this room. I'm looking at the human capacity that is in this room in terms of human, Kenyan human resources. In the 80s, late 80s, when we were fighting to have the NGO um, movement created in Kenya, basically as a free organizing civic societies, yeah? The when we call the first meeting, that time the government wanted to ban NGOs, you know, because that, you know, we didn't have civil society, that term hadn't come, it was NGOs, non-governmental organizations. And the government wa had, uh, ha was pro had proposed an act. That act was essentially, there would be no NGO known as NGO, it would be g uh, government controlled NGOs. So we were opposed to that. When we call the first meeting, do you know how many people turned up? There were about 15 uh, representing uh, various organizations. 15. Now, out of those 15, half were international organizations. The Oxfam, the Action Aids. Very few, hardly more than five, were what you'd call national. Not because others didn't come, it's because they were not there. We just didn't have independent uh, organizations working on issues independently in this country. They were not there. So about 15. Um, and then, even among the, the, the ones I'm saying are Kenyan, you had the churches, NCCK, the Catholic Church, you know, those were the NGOs at that time. So from 15 uh, to the creation, <coughs> we fought to the creation of the National Council of NGOs, we moved on to the creation of the National Civil Society Congress, the NGO board, which we also f literally influenced its nature and structure because initially it was all government. And through that, then the registration of independent organizations started happening to where we are. Where now we can sit here, almost 100 of us, and only a section of the, what, what is the population of Kenyan civil society today? Is there any genius in the room who can imagine? <coughs> it's huge, it's beyond imagination. So see how powerful we are. So if we decide that we want to change society, we want to change thinking in society, we want to, change, we want to shift and change the paradigm of this, uh, uh, we can do it. Because we have much more resources than we had. But it requires organizing. It requires organization, it requires a common philosophy. And it requires a common ideological path. That you're working for on this path and you're aiming at this, then you can change anything. That's how we got the constitution. So um, let us not feel, oh, oh, yeah. Uh, the la there's a lady who mentioned about uh, her daughter who was talking about plants, indigenous plants and the, uh, flowers, and, and she can't find any publication on them. I'll tell you something. Um, at one time, this, uh, fo the forest department in Kenya, let's say the whole study of forestry 
botany, that's to do with plants, was only based on those exotic plants. So you went to university, studied botany, botanical sciences, got a master's, got a PhD, and finished without having any understanding of that flower, the herb growing next to you. But you've done, you have a PhD in botany. You went to forestry school, <coughs> studied forestry, did a master's PhD, but you have no clue about the acacia tree next to you, when it flowers, how it flowers, and so on. Zero. De the, the de when I talk of deconstruction, it's a major issue. We, haven't, we are not there yet. Let us not think that because we have a constitution, we are, there. we are not there yet. There's so much to deconstruct. There's so much to reconstruct so that uh, the young girl can be able to study uh, the local plants. Um, thank you very much. I don't think I have, as I said, I don't have answers. I have questions. And I think what we are doing is we are beginning to define our work plan for the next five years. I'm, I'm really happy when somebody said, I am worried about the health sector. I am worried about the education sector. What does Utu look like? You know, right now they're having these conversations on CBC. My big thing is, what is our philosophy? At the end of it, what do we want to produce? Do we want to produce a worker? If we are saying all our education system is about producing a worker for the economy, or do we want to produce a person who has Utu? Because for me, I would say the goal of the education system should be to produce a, a, a holistic adult who has Utu and is well. You know, talking about health. They are well in every sense, physically, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually. These conversations we're having on, on, uh, here in this hall on education, we must take to the task force. What is Uraya doing about that? My answer is, what are you doing about that? I am going to refuse to answer the questions because I think they're in the room for us to think about them. Um, somebody said something about COVID. That's a really powerful thought. I did a podcast series with Alliance Frances and Ifra during COVID, which we call the Corona Cafes. And we brought professionals from different sectors. And the thing that struck me when I talked to the doctors, I talked to the educators, I talked to um, activists and so on, was people were talking about how, the, how Corona had been a gift in revealing who we are in showing our failings as human beings, because precisely of what you are saying, but how it gives us a challenge so that we say we should not leave corona, as Arundati said, you know, that the pandemic is a portal. We should leave those bad habits behind and emerge as new people. As people who, before that, I wasn't worried about the people living in the slum next to me, now I am. The fact that there are people living in a slum who could not get food means that I cannot eat well until I know that their needs are taken over. Let me go back to Japan very quickly as I finish. Yesterday, I was reading an article where Japanese kindergarten children, at this moment in their schools, when they eat food, when they're eating, they sit at their desks and they're not allowed to speak as they eat. You know, they eat in school. And the reason being is because they are saying, they were taught during corona, you sit, you eat, but you can't talk so that you don't infect the person opposite you. Japanese kindergarten children are challenging their parents and asking, why do we still eat in silence at our tables, whereas adults are sitting in cafes and restaurants and, and at work, and they're being allowed to eat? Kindergarten children are asking that question. They're still eating at their desks. They're still saying we won't break the rules because they're Japanese. But they're challenging adults. That is Utu. Please give me 30 seconds. Mali um, Mushila and uh, my sister, Dada Raham, Ra Ra Rama, this is for you. As you were speaking, a poem that I sometimes perform, Gwatilo Maui, I'll just do the last stanza came to me. The poem is called Invocation for Coming Years. So let me just do that last stanza. Gwatilo says, it's the future I want to clothe, to protect, 
to fatten like the goats in which I put my hope. I shall wrap it in stories told with words, in pictures, in song, in dance. What is past and what is present shall together be a muse for my offspring. I shall be a muse for my offspring. They shall need no others. Like those who have gone before, I shall sometimes lie to cover up my misdoings, but not too well. My children shall know who I am. They shall know the names of trees God gave this land. They shall grow them. They shall play the music we falter to remember. They shall have the, mus the wisdom we make now and that which we neglected to learn. We shall teach it to them, one way or another. Thank you. That's Watilo Mawio. Thank you. Let's give them a hand. Let's give this panel a good, a good clap, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your insights in this discussion. Okay, so we need to, I, I need to go back to Olivia, but I want to recognize the presence of Patience Nyange, who is the current executive director at the Association of Media Women in Kenya. And she threw herself in the ring to vie for the Taita Taveta governorship. Let's clap for Patience. She'll be coming later. Thank you very much. Let's go back. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the good session that we've had. Uh, though we have exceeded and we have spilled over, it is still good because it was an important discussion and a discussion that had to be uh, done. So I want to invite us for um, tea break. And uh, maybe because we have uh, really spilled over, we will take a short time having tea and then come immediately right back into the room so that we can go straight to the next session. I don't us want us to be late for this. So can we take uh, 20 minutes for break instead of 30 minutes? Is that possible? Please help me to regain the time. So let's just go out and have tea. Um, uh, during the morning, I don't uh, remember us praying for tea, so I will do that. Let's just close our eyes for one second. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that as we go to partake the tea that we've been provided, bless it, let it nourish us, in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you. Remember, 20 minutes, 20 minutes, so don't take your time. Just hurry out. 20 minutes for tea. As the Advocacy and Communications Program Officer, she has also worked at Nation Media Group as a radio news presenter for Easy FM and online sub-editor and I choose life as a program trainer and assistant program manager. She also sits on the board of I choose life currently and serves in the resource mobilization and communications board committee. She holds a master's of arts in communication studies from the School of Journalism, University of Nairobi, and a bachelor of arts degree from Kenyatta University. Thank you so much and welcome to take us through this. Please let's applaud her. Thank you very much, Lillian. Olivia. Olivia, sorry, Olivia. Um, and thank you for the introduction. I hope I live up to the expectations that you have set. And thank you very much, Uraya, for introducing us uh, to this very important topic on Utu. Very interesting discussion. And I hope that this next session takes us towards that point where we delve a little bit further into the practicalities of how we create a foundation for a national culture of Utu. So I have a very rich panel and quite excited to be having this discussion with people from different sectors. Actually, I'd call it a multi-sectoral panel. We have the private sector, we have uh, civil society, we have the media, and we also have a government representative. So very rich, you know, at three kind of 360 degree view and discussion of what needs to be done 
across different areas for us to be able to create a foundation of a national culture on Utu. So I'll go ahead to call the, the different panelists who are here with me today. Perhaps maybe the organizers will need one more seat because we have three we have three panelists. So I will call them up and I will start with Wafula Nyongesa from the Directorate of National Values and Cohesion. Do we have Mr. Wafula? Thank you very much. Karibu. I will introduce you as you before you speak. You're the first one up, so you can choose where you want to sit, where you feel safe. <laughs> if you sit close to me, you'll have more questions to answer. I would also like to call upon Mr. Joshua Changuong, the Executive Director of CRECO. I'll also introduce CRECO as we go along. Karibu sana. In our circles, we call him Kiongozi. Ata kingia unona ya kwamba, anaingia kama Kiongozi. The next person I want to call upon is Ms. Gloria Ndekei, Executive Director of KEPSA Foundation. Gloria, are you here? Gloria? Is Gloria here, Olivia? He is not in the room. Okay. We'll go ahead to invite Ms. Patience Nyange, Governor. Najwa, once you buy, you, you will take that title. She's the executive director, new executive director of the Association of Media Women in Kenya. I was just joking with her and asking her whether this is her maiden panel discussion since she was uh, just recently appointed. And she told me no, that she was on a panel yesterday, but I didn't see her in the program, so I told her, you will me get crash. He's us and your maiden panel, so caribou patience. We also have Evans Kasena from Kwacha Africa. Evans, you're here? Karibu, come on up. And then we have Locha Erukudi from the Office of the Registrar of Political Parties. Locha, Karibu. So we'll have some initial thoughts from our panelists. We are discussing national values and principles of good governance. We are going to be talking about what is the progress achieved in the realization of nationhood. And we're going to look at it from the different perspectives from the representatives of you know, the different sectors and institutions here. And that's why I, was, I said it's, it's an opportunity to just analyze and discuss this uh, across different levels and layers. And for many people, I think when we first passed this because I still call it new. I call it a new constitution. Is it 12 years later? Because a number of the provisions in that constitution are yet to be implemented, including Article 10 on national values and principles of governance. So forgive me if I keep on calling it or referring to it as the new constitution. I think until we are able to implement a number of the key critical provisions, particularly those that are touching on the issues that we have talked about today on Utu, then we will still call it new until we are able to leave the full dream and promise of Katiba 2010. But we are here to talk about national values and principles of governance, Article 10 of our Constitution. For those who have the Katiba, I have four, I have four constitutions. Actually, there are six. I don't know that these are for <laughs> all the different uh, moderators and panelists that come here. Olivia, I'll pick one. But for those who have the katibas in front of you, if you go to Article 10 of the Constitution, I think for me it's, it's the primary, uh, it has always been the primary focus for me. When I look at it, I get a sense of direction on where Kenya needs to go. But it says, it talks about the national values and principles of governance, which include patriotism, national unity, sharing and devolution of power, the rule of law, democracy and participation of the people, human dignity, equity, social justice, inclusiveness, equality, human rights, non-discrimination and protection of the marginalized, and then good governance, integrity, transparency and accountability, and sustainable development. There's actually a section there uh, that is 2B, 
which I always feel should have been listed first. Before you go to, before you talk about good governance, integrity, transparency, accountability, sustainable development, you know, public participation, rule of law, I think the basic things you should be looking at are under 2B, human dignity, equity, social justice, inclusiveness, equality, human rights, non-discrimination, and protection of the marginalized. That's, that's what we're talking about here, right? And I, I just wanted to put this in the context of what I want our panelists to be able to share with us, because we'll just dig right into the conversation, because I nanaskia muda imetupa, natunasema aje muda imetupa kisugu. So I, I will jump straight into the panelist discussion so that we can also have time to also interrogate and give feedback and input uh, from, from the audience. And I, I want to start with Mr. Wafula, uh, because you, you work in a, in a critical organization, the Directorate of National Cohesion and Values. Let me just introduce you and your organization a little bit which was established in 2008 um, and uh, through a presidential circular in May 2008 and operationalized in 2009 to spearhead the promotion of national cohesion and integration and national values and principles of governance. Now the mandate of your directorate is grounded in articles four and of course 10 of the constitution on national values and principles of governance. And what your uh, profile further says is that the mandate of the direc directorate augments the exercise on presidential authority and functions on the promotion of national unity, uh, national values and social justice. And your directorate coordinates implementation of sessional paper eight of 2013 on national values and principles of governance. I hope I got that right. And so in, in light of the work that you do, I don't know how many people are aware, but you have even set indicators to assess uh, performance contracting of state agencies, MDAs, ministries, departments, and agencies in regard to how their work, you know, reflects Article 10 of the Constitution and whether this is helping us in terms of meeting our goals in regard to service delivery, is it promoting access and delivery of services? Anyway, you'll tell us a little bit more. I know also that last month you launched a training manual uh, for on, on national values and principles of governance, I think, to help uh, MDAs uh, to be able to set targets, implement, but you can tell us a little bit more because we want to understand that. Where are we going? When, I think there was a lady called S Susan in the previous session, she, and when she spoke, I think uh, uh, many of us, because she spoke from a mother's, you know, you could hear that mother's cry, Leo wa mama, that when she goes to hospital, you still have challenges in terms of accessing basic services. Unenda hospitali, upati madawa ama upati huduma ambao unastahili kupata kutoka madaktari na, wa, na and, and uh, wakuguzi wa and others wakaguzi and others who are there who are supposed to help us uh, and so you could hear that deep cry you know from her you know what's happening so we want to understand from the perspective of the public sector on your work where are we going in regard to meeting progress in realizing article 10 on national values and principles of governance, particularly even in light of trying to realize, you know, our, our dreams of becoming a nation. You know, we, we, we claim that as a country, we are supposed to have a shared, you know, culture, shared goals, and, and all these things that bring us together. But from the previous session when Dr. Mshai shared, when Awori shared, you, ca you can see that many people feel that we are, we are far from it. So just maybe take five minutes, because we'll come back again to, uh, we'll come back again to you. That's why I'm limiting this initial so that we can get input from all the panelists and also engage a little bit more with the audience and we'll still come back uh, to you. But just take the initial five minutes, tell us some of the things that you have done, particularly in light of helping us meet the aspirations of Article 10 and trying to get to see Utu in, in our public sector. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk about national values. Uh, I should begin by saying national values being enshrined in the Constitution in 2010 is, a, is an indicator that there was a gap that needed to be filled. We want to understand national values to be 
a part of the culture of our people. And uh, at the time of drafting the constitution, it was noted that uh, our society lacked uh, morals to guide us, to unite us. And there are many indicators. Just looking uh, a little bit behind in 2008, uh, the post-election violence and the reactions by Kenyans uh, tell, tells it all. So we begin to enshrine uh, the national values in 2010, and therefore it means uh, we have to work overdrive to make sure that these values are ingrained in the Kenyan society. And that's why Article 132 of the Constitution commits the president among his functions is that uh, he must track the measures that are, are being put in place to promote these values and report to Kenyans, which he does uh, during the State of the Nation address. So that is uh, as high and as important it, uh, as it is for us to begin to work to mainstream national values in our behavior, in our culture, and in our governance systems. Uh, having said that, uh, because we are looking at progress where we are in terms of national values, and there are two levels at which I would look at this. Uh, as the directorate that coordinates from government point of view, measures uh, that are being put place uh, by both government and uh, all agencies within the government, within Kenya, to promote national values, uh, we have uh, one important thing is we have put in place a policy. There is a national session of paper number eight of 2013 on national values and principles of governance, which demonstrates the commitment by government uh, to drive the values driven, I mean change within our society. Other than that, in terms of monitoring, uh, we do that regularly through the annual president's report, uh, which we do to enable him report on measures taken and progress achieved. And therefore, we have a catalog every year of what is being done. So far, we have captured what all government agencies are doing that. And uh, to ensure that this is done, uh, we have committed them through the performance contracting platform that each agency commits uh, as part of what they will do every year to fulfill certain measures. And at the end of the year, we take the report and for all agencies, we compile, and that's how we get the report. So that is what informs the State of the Nation address. Uh, on the other side, we did conduct a national survey. I think that would be important uh, on what the status of national values, where we are. And that was conducted 2015, 2016. I think that gives us specific uh, indicators. Uh, this was uh, scientifically done. We contracted uh, Kipra uh, to spearhead this process. And uh, we covered all aspects, including levels of awareness, where if I may just point out a few of those, uh, within the public sector, it was found to be 59%, and the private sector, levels of awareness were at uh, 43%. Another indicator that we uh, was cited was uh, in terms of um, perception on equity, uh, in terms of uh, public resource use. How do Kenyans perceive equity in resource use, where it was found uh, at the national government resource level, it was 41%, county government level was at 47%, private sector 38 and uh, the informal sector, uh, the perception was at 30%. And uh, on terms of uh, assessing adherence, because one would want to know, we may have national values, but to what extent are Kenyans adhering uh, to those values? So it was uh, found from that survey that the executive uh, was perceived to be at 46% in, 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 in adhering to national values, 46 out of 100%. Judiciary at 47%, the National Assembly at 30 and County Assembly at 28, and the County Executive at 26%. Uh, perception on uh, corruption, this will also be important for us because values, again, are supposed to help us guard against excesses in the line of corruption. The perception here was uh, uh, at the nation, that, that means for those who said uh, corruption is indeed significant, 73% uh, were from the national, I mean the national executive was perceived at 73%. Uh, judiciary, uh, it was perceived at 76%, that was 2015-2016. The National Assembly, 77%. The National Police Service at 81%, the education sector at uh, 73%, the National Registration uh, of Persons 71%, County Executive at 80 
and county assembly at 81. Those are figures coming from the survey in that year. And then number five, the assessment on uh, transparency and accountability, that how transparent and how open are we. In terms of uh, uh, transparency, uh, those who perceived it as much, uh, that there is uh, much uh, transparency, there was 31%, and those who say it's deteriorating was 68%. In terms of public trust, we have 41% uh, who felt there is public trust, and 58% uh, felt there wasn't public trust. And then number six, effectiveness of uh, checks and balances. How effective uh, are the checks and balances that we have in our country? How are, are they in checking those excesses? For the national executive, 42. For the judiciary, 45%. National Assembly, 38. The National Police Service, 32. And then uh, the county executive, 31. And county assembly, 29. And then uh, the number seven, which is the last one I'll share with us, is uh, the aspect of uh, the aspect of uh, the rating on uh, service delivery, so that we are saying how effective are service being delivered by various agencies uh, being uh, equitable. And then we have uh, the executive, they are perceived to be 58% effective, judiciary 56, National Assembly 28, National Police 28 again, county executive 24, and the county assembly at 20. And uh, it will also be important to see how the public perceived uh, that lack of uh, equity and why the service delivery was not being equitable uh, across the sector. Four reasons were given. One was that uh, they perceived weak institutions as uh, the reason. Number two, they perceived that some laws were either weak or they were not being uh, enforced. And number three, that uh, uh, there was inadequacy of public participation. And number last was that there was weak management of diversity as reasons that explain the various differences. So those are uh, some of the figures that I can share from our perspective in terms of where we are and uh, what uh, needs to be done to realize these national values and principles of governance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Afula. I think that's, that's, that's quite interesting data. I don't know that there is a report published, if it's out there, that we can then be able to access. That okay. is uh, contained the status of national values, okay. a survey conducted by Kipra. It's on our website. Okay, so it's on your website. Yes. So I think we can visit the website. I'll probably I'll, we'll, we'll coordinate with Raya to share that, yeah, so that we can then uh, be able to get more information. Uh, on that particular survey, just to inform uh, our discussion further. I would now like to, there's one more panelist, is that Gloria? Gloria, please join us on the podium, Karibu Sana. We are joined by Ms. Gloria Ndekei. She's the executive director of KEPSA Foundation. As I said, this is a multi-sectoral panel. So she will enrich the discussion by giving us the viewpoint of, of KEPSA as well. Because we're also interested to know how, how far can we go with UTU, whether we can extend it also in terms of how we conduct our business. But Gloria, we'll give you time to catch up and uh, you'll, you'll be able to contribute once we are done with the other panelists as well. So I want us to listen to Kiongozi, Joshua Changuoni. Joshua, as I said, is the executive director of CRECO. And, and CRECO is a network of civil society organizations um, who are involved in human rights, governance, and democracy work, and has been in existence, I think, for the last 25 years or so, and has done quite a bit of work. I think when I reflect on the issues of national values and principles of governance, I appreciate the work that CRECO has done, I think, in the last five years or so, in terms of just monitoring how far we have gone in regard to implementing at Article 10 on uh, national values and principles of governance. So they've been giving us reports. We've also had opportunity to work with them as civil society organizations. They've brought us together to look at this issue. 
and just inform us as civil society and also as citizens, just guiding us in regard to implementation, implementation of the Constitution, particularly in regard to Article 10. And I want him to just share from the work that they've done in the last few years. And by the way, I don't know that each of you has this, but you'll see a booklet, Values in Practice, a training guide on national values and principles of governance that was published by CRECO, I think through the support of URAIA, which will probably give us more insight on, on some of these issues that he'll be talking about. So I want him to just reflect on the work that you have done in the last couple of years, the monitoring work, the implementation, and I know specifically that there was a time you also did some research on the implementation of the national values and principles of governance into the education sector. You know, we are now talking about CBC. We now have a, a, a working party which is really looking at our curriculum. And is this something, is this an opportunity even to further infuse the, the whole idea of UTU as we talk about our education system as well? So Joshua, I want you to just reflect on some of these issues as you give us further guidance on how we proceed to create a strong foundation for a nation that is guided by Utu. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sheila, um, for that kind introduction. But let me begin by sharing some words uh, by an author called Dr. Sheila Bafid uh, Wamahiu, who said education without values, like science without ethics is dangerous, destructive and not sustainable. And I will also want to confirm here that um, the work uh, presented by Mr. Wafula is true. We've been monitoring uh, and also partnering with them. But uh, what the president gives us in form of the state of the nation address in terms of uh, progress made in implementation of national values and principles of governance, as well as also practice, is not um, um, what um, Mr. Wafula usually presents, and that's not to put you on the spot, because we also do monitoring of uh, state of the nation address and produce a shadow report. What um, the head of state um, um, usually gives, and uh, in respect with you know uh, what has been happening for the last five years, is the milestones for the political party in power, which is contrary to the provisions of the constitution. Uh, because when you read the spirit and even the writing of uh, you know, that state of the nation address is more of what we've done as a party. And we've had issues with that because that is not what is expected. I know there are three elements, state of commitment on international obligations, uh, progress made in implementation of the national values and principles of governance, as well as also the status of security of the country. Those are two, three key elements. But as CRECO, um, we've been reflecting a lot on this Article 10 of the Constitution. And uh, it's not only about awareness creation and people to be aware that they, there exists an article in the Constitution that talks about uh, 16 areas, patriotism, uh, national unity, democracy, public participation, and all those that are, uh, are you know, included there. We, we, I would like at this juncture to pose some very uncomfortable questions. And this is not to make this forum uh, a bit um, uh, boring. But let me ask you, is there UTU in civil society? Let me ask you another question. There are nine of them. Please uh, bear with me. Is there dignity in civil society? Is there corruption in civil society? Okay, those are not my answers. Is there democracy in civil society organizations? Is there sustainable development in civil society? Is there unity in civil society? Why is the narrative evil society and foreign agencies gaining momentum among Kenyan citizens? Some say it's disinformation. But is it not what is out there in social media? Are we happy as civil society? And lastly, is there transparency and accountability in civil society? I don't need answers, um, Sheila, but I ask those questions for reflection because I know those are things we keep on asking ourselves. 
And as we speak, we've been in the recent past eh, been reflecting on these kind of questions and even resorted as civil society leaders to have a fireplace talk, informal, without necessarily having papers, programs, and all that, and say, who are we serving? Are the people we are serving comfortable of our representation? And these are discussions that we spearhead as organizations, however uncomfortable they may be, because we start from where we are before we point fingers at the duty uh, you know, bearer. I mean, we represent the supply side. I, I mean, the demand side. The supply side is on the other hand where we keep on check. So as CRECO, we do monitoring of implementation, ownership, and practice of national values. And uh, this um, informed by different spaces that are available in our country, including the current competent based um, curriculum, the CBC. Because the drafters of the framework of CBC identified absence of ethos and values in our society. Uh, hence, you know, the problems that we face in schools, which ended up becoming national disasters. And there are so many of them. And I will just want to highlight two of them, like the burning of schools. We are all aware of now our children, we are burning schools. Little did they know that it is the same parents who are taking care of them who invested in those schools. And once buildings are brought down, it's the same parents who are being charged to reconstruct those schools. We've heard of our children telling um, um, please, if you don't allow us to go home, uh, we will burn the school. And we've seen teachers becoming helpless and even let these children go home for a break and they come back at their own. Uh, they even say, we will come back next year. And then the last bit, as uh, cheating in national exams became a national disaster. And I don't think we've ever even overcome that, um, you know, uh, di I mean, um, um, you know, ch dilemma in our country. So I, 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 we ask ourselves that in this society that we are living, in terms of generational gaps, um, CBC, um, you know, drafters said that parents have left the children to the teachers. So they wanted... Um, you know, a space where the parent is involved, the pupil is involved, and the teacher is involved. But I think the first complainant of um, how CBC is very tiring and how it is very nagging and pesking was the parent. You saw what was happening in social media, including the homework that the children were being given. Eh? So it was a clear demonstration that this was a child who had been left to, to the teacher. And we did a baseline survey, and I would be sharing a little bit, just you know, in a few minutes, uh, Sheila, if you'll allow me, on some of the findings that we found. Uh, two minutes, okay, I'll do that. That, um, you know, the problems and challenges is like, you know, there's a deficit of role models in society. Get rich quick is now dominating the minds of our children. Uh, we have people in our society who have never been employed. They are not in business, but they are very rich. Those are the, 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 the people, our children admire them. Uh, and they, um, um, they, they, they ask, you, you know, so and so, you know, has not even been employed and drives uh, the top range of the vehicle on the roads. So, so you see those. Or so and so was in government and was a thief uh, and has all these buildings. So those are people our children now admire. They can get rich quick uh, syndrome, which has really entered into our children. And we found that, where they even ask teachers now, um, all these, is he, uh, and, and, and they, they are very quick even to cite some of these iconic uh, people, uh, uh, you know, the founders of some of these infrastructure technology, and all they say they never went, to, they never finished school. So why are we even studying and all that? And uh, um, I will be sharing this report later on, but let me just, you know, highlight some of these. And then poor parenting. I don't think we have any curriculum or any manual on how you bring up your children in our country. But I think the African culture, um, I think Professor uh, uh, Julius here, you will tell us that um, there was unwritten uh, ways on how parents used to bring their children, and it was a custom. Now we've lost that completely. Uh, uh, it depends. You know, now we say there's democracy in families. 
You cannot interview. In previously, the, a child used to belong to the society. Um, and, and even in terms of even this food security, there was a way on how the society used to handle that. There was a key in the African culture where it was kept, the granary that was kept until there is the another cycle of crop that is ripe from the farm. I, I mean, it was unwritten, but people really controlled the hunger. But look at what we are doing now. We are discussing GMOs. We are discussing, I don't know how many, 13 counties, 23, which have not received rain and all that kind of stuff. And then um, 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 the, 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 the influence negative of the print and the social media, uh, that is what Kenyans believe that is contributing to erosion of values. But again, we must also challenge that because CBC is saying expose your, chi your child to the digital uh, uh, you know, um, uh, platforms and technology. Not doing certificate in computer, but if they, you have a phone and there's internet, give it to your child. Um, um, let this child be, uh, you know, um, te technologically what literate. They say it's something like that. So, so is there prevention of the same? But we are not saying that now. Even if you remove this technology exposure to, from this child, you will have succeeded as a parent. But how do you go ahead to understand on the do's and the don'ts on these uh, particular technology uh, platforms? Then, just in summary, is um, I think we are bringing our children in a society that is dominated by materialism. Materialism in the sense that it is about what is mine. It is not what I can share with somebody probably who is next to me. This is mine, you know, this is, this is mine. It's me who got it. And that has really indoctrinated the mindset of our children, including even our parents. And then the last bit is we are in a society of individualism. This individualism is something that has really entered into us it is slowly getting into our children. Uh, and in conclusion, uh, from our finding, uh, in as much as at this age set, we are finding tribalism and ethnicity to be a cancer that is affecting probably our democracy and our elections. But I can tell you, our children have no uh, um, um, you know, definition of what is ethnicity and the tribalism. You ask your child who is the best friend there in the school, if it is um, an heterogeneous school where it's not a local school where it's dominated by a particular ethnicity, will give you somebody just by name, but not necessarily that this is so and so. So this thing is going even to die naturally, and it will be practiced by our children. So we, there is the positives in terms of um, how what we are witnessing currently in our society, and there are also negatives in terms of what we are losing as an African heritage and cultured society because our children are more obliged to the Western uh, cultures and how to do things. Thank you so much, Sheila. Thank you very much, Joshua. Speaking from the gut, <laughs> I could feel that. I'm, I'm going to jump, I'm going to allow me to skip you, Evans, for now. I actually want to get the perspectives of the media because um, Joshua has raised some issues there, then I'll come back to you, Locha, and then Evans as well, as we, we continue this discussion. But patience, maybe in, in, in four minutes, if you could just tell us, reflect on what would be the role of media in this whole conversation. How do we create a value-driven media? Joshua has raised as one of the findings that one of the challenges that we've had is the negative influence of media uh, and social media and so on. But maybe before I let you dive in, perhaps just an introduction to the organization that you are, are representing. And I'm also happy to note that Patience is a former colleague. We worked together at, at BBC Media Action some 10 years ago. And so happy to see her, to share this uh, podium with her, especially as she takes on her new role at, um, at AMWIC, but just a little bit about AMWIC, of which I'm also a member. I know that she is now the ED. I will renew my membership immediately. <laughs> but AMWIC is, is a media women's uh, membership organization. It was established in 1982, more than 40 years ago. And uh, it brings together women and uplifts the voices of, of women who previously received little or no attention in the media. Uh, AMWIC's vision is to see a society in which the media embraces and promotes equitable development, human rights, and women rights, 
and its mission is to use the media to promote an informed and gender responsive society. So patience, in light of what Amrik does with all your experience in the media, because I know your experience in the media is as, is, is as long as mine, I, I want you to reflect on that question because we know the media as a powerful tool for social change and agenda setting, uh, which we have used previously for public awareness. How do we use it to promote this, the, the Utu culture? But also, I want you to reflect on what Joshua has said about the negative influence of media as well. In four minutes, please. Okay. I know you are a Mwanasiasa, but I hope you may have Now we want to hear you as, <laughs> as a media professional, so keep to the time. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sheila. I think Sheila is being very modest. She was my boss at the BBC Media Action. So, well, I'm very happy to be sharing this panel with her. And yesterday, while you were away, Sheila, I was giving remarks on behalf of the men, and I hoped that today the panel will have changed. So at least I'm happy to have you as the moderator, and then, of course, with my colleague Gloria here. So we keep encouraging all the organizations, as you continue to do such kind of gatherings, please ensure that we have women voices amplified. Ensure in your uh, balancing of the panel, we have a number of women there. So well, thank you so much for asking me to reflect on the role of media in this kind of work and the kind of O2. And as I listened to Joshua and the rest of the panelists, I was asking myself, when I went through my training in communications, I, didn't, I don't remember having a curriculum that talked about national values. We didn't discuss what it is that national values should be. Or in our reportage of our day-to-day -day issues within the media, how do we report focusing on national values? And while we have asked ourselves questions, and I listened to the questions that Joshua asked and is asking the same questions as I, is there Utu in our reporting? As you watch news every day, as you read our reportage, do you see that we report with focusing on national values? Have we as media people you know, failed in our reportage and in our enhancing of national values. Is there a dignity in our reporting? Earlier today, before I came here, I had a um, meeting that I was attending, and we were reflecting on the post-analysis of how we reported women during the 2022 elections. And I know most of you have probably seen that women are always reported always on the negative side of life. And while I was giving my own experience, saying, for me, media were very friendly to me, and most likely because I was one of them. And a number of times they kept telling me, patients, we weren't to not a Ukikuwa governor, we were tasema sisi tukona governor, we took media. So maybe that's really one of the reasons that probably I got positive coverage. But again, a number of women most of the time are reported in the, you know, in the wrong side of life. So in our reported as media, I wouldn't blame the media in how we have reported probably. It's because none of us, uh, we have probably less trainings on how do you report, how do we cover. A lot of the time we think about the ethical, I mean the code of conduct which guides our work as uh, journalists or within the media practice. But there's really very little focus on the national values and in our reportage this is how we report. But the question begs, how do we, is there a relative measure of national values, of Utu? Is there a relative, can we say this is how we measure Utu. So that in our reportage at the end of the year, maybe we can meet as media people within the media fraternity and sit down and ask ourselves, how did we report X, Y, Z in this year? How did we cover our elections during this year? Did we focus on the national values? And while now we have a new challenge, of course, with the new age media, uh, with the new era, or rather, would we say the digital media, social media is within our spaces. Every person has become a reporter in their own sense. Every person has a right to post whatever it is that they post. And our children, as they're growing up, they're growing up within the influence of the social media. And so everyone is reporting, everyone is uh, tweeting, everyone is writing whatever they're writing on their spaces. So in the same manner, are we discussing, discussing national values within our spaces where we are, whether it's within our work spaces or within our fa family settings? Because the media guys don't live in a vacuum. They are within our spaces, and in those spaces, our work is to report, and most of the time is to flash the news, is to come to be the first person to say, this has, is to break news, really. Everyone wants to be the first to break news. And so sometimes we probably don't consciously remember that we have national values that we need to be conscious of when we are, when we are reporting. So while I will fault media to some extent, 
that uh, but there is work to be done and of course that's why we have many other organizations including the CBO, the CSOs that are here with us to question the reportage in media to ask and to evaluate how far have we come what are the matrix matrix what are the parameters that we should be looking at and to say in this way in our reportage and how we have done then we have probably fo uh, focused on the national values as they are much patience also for keeping to time <laughs> and at this point I want us to shift to the office of the registrar of political parties we have a representative here Locha Erukudi and Locha we know what the okay let me introduce the ORPP uh, let me not assume that we all know what ORPP is but you your mission your, your mandate is to register and regulate political parties and administer the political parties fund. And I, when I read many of your documents, you say your mission is to promote the realization of political rights through re registration and regula regulation of political parties in Kenya. I would just be interested to know at what point do you get as a, as a regulator of, of pol and a registrar of political parties to look at the issues of national values and the principles of governance. In fact, as Joshua was speaking, and also patience, um, when you talked about coverage even during the, the elections, and Joshua talked about reporting of national values and principles of governance during the State of the Nation address, I don't know how many people you realized, did we hear any of our political parties during their manifestos uh, talk about, or the campaigns talk about national values? We had some talk about Utu, Sivio. Yeah, we had some talking about Utu. But did, was it just, you know, for the sake of, of, of the campaigns or throwing in a word that we want to hear, or did they really reflect on the issue of national values? So I think what I want, Locha, maybe if you can take three minutes, just to speak about to what extent do you, uh, do political parties engage in this issue? Is it a matter that you look at as you, as you regulate? You know, how are you capturing these issues around national values and principles of governance? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Locha Irukudi, uh, manager in charge of registration of political parties in our beloved country. Uh, it was the CEO uh, the register of political parties who was supposed to come here, uh, but uh, she's outside the country, so I'm here uh, on her behalf. Uh, basically, in the last 24 hours, as an office, we lost 25 members of political parties within Nairobi because of accidents in the last 24 hours. We have about, let me repeat, I can easily read the body language of some participants, let me repeat. For the last, within the last 24 hours, we lost 25 people, Kenyans, within Nairobi because of accidents. Let's come back to Utu. Utu simply means humanism. Meaning, in this city, within the last 24 hours, we have had drivers, we have had traffic officers who have not done their work accordingly. That is why we have lost 25 Kenyans. As an office, as rightly stated by the moderator, our work is clearly captured in the laws of our land, we basically register, regulate, and administer the political parties fund. In all the tasks that we do as an office, we are clearly guided by Article 10 of the Kenyan Constitution, 
which focuses basically on the national values. As the manager in charge of registration of political parties, we usually do not register political parties without membership across the country. We usually have about 24,000 members. For a party to be registered in this country, the membership has to be 24,000 members across the country. At least 1,000 in a majority of the counties. We know that a majority of the counties usually is 24. So for a political party to be registered in this country, it has to have 24,000 members in 24 counties across the country. That basically tells you that political parties' registration fosters national unity. I know before, uh, before the enactment of our current act, Political Parties Act of 2011, we used to register political parties using the Societies Act of 1968. Then, it was possible as a family to register a political party then. But now, because of the law, it is not possible. So in a way, in, in uh, all the registration of political parties uh, aspects, we ensure that the national values are well covered. As we speak now, in this country, we have 90 fully registered political parties. I know, I know most Kenyans are aware of, of the big 10, they, they call them the big 10, the big 12, but in our office, we recognize legally that we have 90 uh, political parties, uh, sorry, 90 political parties in the entire country. The issue of inclusivity is also part and parcel of the registration process. A party cannot be registered without complying with Article 27 of the Kenyan Constitution, which clearly uh, states that we are not allowed to register a political party of men only. We are not allowed to register a political party of women only, or youth only. We are not allowed by law. Any Kenyan can go to court and challenge the registration of that political party. Two-thirds gender rule must be complied with. The other day, a minute. Wrap up? Yeah. Okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, when you work with politicians, you talk like them. When a politician gets a mic, okay, yeah, I, w I, I worked with them in IBC and now in the Regency of Political Parties, but I will take, I will take that second. <laughs> the minute is already up. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, what as an office we do is that for a party to be registered, it has to comply with the national values of this country. Something important that I want to mention within the 30 seconds I'm given, that I've been given, is that as we speak now, because of the new legal regime, more political parties are benefiting from the political parties fund. You are aware that during the last electoral cycle, only two political parties benefited. But now, about 48, a record 48 political parties are benefiting from the fund. But there is a requirement, there is a requirement that parties, for parties to get the funding, they must comply with some values. Like for instance, the two-thirds gender rule. That must be there. The minorities 
and marginalized must be, the key word is, must be represented in the governing body. Thank you. The governing bodies, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Loch. I would like to probably, when we come back to conclude, just hear how those mechanisms that you have put in place in line with Article 10, how they are actually helping us also to see political parties, you know, work and, and translate their visions and, 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 and their goals, ambitions into ensuring that we have a, a nation, a national culture for Utu, but we'll come back to that. I want to quickly go to our next speaker from Kwacha, Africa, and that is Evans Kasena. He's been very patient waiting. And we really want to, um, we're interested to hear from Evans because he sits here representing the youth because his organization engages the youth in social and economic empowerment uh, initiatives and trying to uplift mm -hmm. their living standards, uh, trying to empower them to transform themselves and their communities. I think Evans, the short thing that we want to hear from you is how youth, how do we, how do we see youth uh, being able, perhaps, to find the compass that maybe as uh, an older generation we haven't been able to find, which I hope we will now that we're having this discussion, particularly in, in light of our values and in light of building that nation, national culture of Utu. Do we have hope in the youth? I think that's the long and short of my question. Three yeah, thank you so much for your question. Uh, I, I, I think uh, we still have a long way to go in terms of the youth to engage into those values, because as the other speakers have said, uh, we lack role models in our communities nowadays, because the young people are so disparate in, in a way that they, they believe the only way to succeed is to go to the shortcut. And uh, I if you see even how the governments are working, the way they behave, because sometimes the young people, they don't have hope because of uh, the opportunities around them are not really getting to them. And uh, the, big, uh, the, 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 the simple example is the issue of the 30% uh, tender, uh, which this needs to go to the young people at the same time uh, helping them, uh, the people living with the disabilities and women. You'll find that the more young people who are not active in politics in terms of uh, uh, forming groups to support some politicians when election ends, they end up not getting anything because they are nowhere to be found within the plan of a politician. And then these tenders will not even go to them. But uh, mostly the tenders will be given to the cronies of this politician uh, to, to benefit. And sometimes you will see the government give you data of this money went to the youth. But if you do even follow up, you will find out uh, the youth are not even the directors of that organization. So I think the young people, they have lose hope because there's no one who is there talking for, for their needs. And the few who are there, they're there to uh, speak on behalf of the young people, but to make themselves beneficial uh, in, in terms of what the youth are supposed to get, either from the government or from any other well wishes. That is what I can say. And Evans, you're giving us a good example, keeping to time. I told you three minutes, you've taken less. We can learn so much from our young people. And um, Miss Gloria Decay, I want you to keep in the same spirit. Um, just take three minutes. I, you're here representing Kepsa Foundation. And I think the question is, how do we create a value-laden private sector? How does the private sector help us to enhance, you know, the... the that value of Utu, you know, as we are speaking to it. Because as, as Kepsa Foundation, you are, I think, the foundation arm of, of Kepsa, as I understand, and you're focusing on social issues in regard to, you know, as you improve the business environment, but you're also looking at issues around national values, governance, ethics, sound business practices, security, environment, water conservation, I think health, youth, education, women, you know, gender empowerment, children welfare, all these things. And we have spoken the whole morning as I've sat here, we have touched on these things. Mm -hmm. So we also want to understand, because this is your goal as Kepsa Foundation, but you are trying to do this as you create a positive, healthy business environment for your members, you know, the private sector. How, how can we look up to the private sector uh, to, to enhance Utu as you continue to make money and make this economy, you know, progress? Thank you very much. Uh, 
and I'm delighted to be in this space. It is good to recognize that uh, business needs to be in a space like this, and also as KEPSA, we have recognized that we can't work alone. We cannot do business in isolation. There are certain enablers that will make business thrive. With experience and uh, speaking, um, mentioning that KEPSA's role is to promote an enabling business environment for its members, as well as to promote ease of doing business. KEPSA recognized that there is a cost to business that is, no, is very negative. When we shut our doors and windows and decide not to discuss issues of good governance, then we realized that business cannot flourish because there are losses that are implied as a result of not adhering to good governance. And good governance is not just about ethics and transparency. It's about sustainable development. And we realized, we realized that if we do not comply, if we do not preach issues of Utu, then business was affected very negatively. How? Uh, if you take the leadership of the companies, we felt that every leader had the mandate to uphold the reputation of their organization. The reputation of organizations means everything. People not, might not come to your door and say and brand you a corrupt organization, but just by being named as a corrupt person, it attains your organization. KEPSA realized that issues of trust come as a result of having bad governance. And when there are issues of trust in organizations, then you find that employer-employee relationships are strained. If you are not talking in tandem, the employer and the employee are not talking in tandem, then one of them is stealing from the other, be it in salary or be it in hours of business, which translates to loss of business. Uh, if you're not transparent as an employee to your employer, then it basically means you can walk out you can steal hours from business. You can pick something and just go out. And also, as the owner of the organization, you probably are not paying taxes. Issues of not paying taxes translate very negatively to everybody. Because at the end of the day, if some businesses are evading taxes, then it means others are overpaying. And if they are overpaying, then it will be driving on their profits. So as, a, as an apex body that seeks to promote business and from the foundation point of view, we felt that we needed to address the social pillar. By addressing the social pillar, then we felt that we were going to address issues that deal with human capital. And KEPSA, how, uh, the, the, in, in, in the way it, it chose to address that, it has a wing called Mukenya Daima. Mukenya Daima promotes peace, and Mukenya Daima has been working very tirelessly with Uraia during the past elections. Mukenya Daima looks that at economic pillar in terms of promoting leadership. Who are the good leaders that are going to make us not get into business laws? It talks about the social pillar. Social pillar, is, and it talks about even the, pol the, the political pillar and talks about the social pillar in terms of promoting peace in elections. Because if we don't have peace, we have realized that every five years in, during the election year, businesses go down. Profits are actually uh, attacked. There is also the multi-sector multi anti-corruption committee that kept us set up, which was going to see that the companies adhered to good governance. At the moment, after the Bribery Act 2016, KEPSA has committed a manager in place to organize and simplify the tools to speak to the operationalization of the Bribery Act. And lastly, KEPSA has, uh, has uh, collaborated with UNODC, UNODC 
and the blue economy so that we are going to have peace ambassadors, no ethics ambassadors in companies. And that project is going to start in January and a lot of work has been put in that. So we agree that Utu and good governance is also a good catalyst for business. And we'll end the first part of this panel discussion on that note by going back to the audience. We've listened to media, private sector, uh, the Office of the Registrar of Political Parties, civil society, and also um, government through uh, Wafula Nyongesa representing the Director of National Values and Cohesion. And I want to take it back to the audience. I know there are probably many thoughts, many some reflections, maybe some questions, but because I don't want to stand between yourself and the, the, the lunch hour break, because we've been seated here for a long time as well, I would ask that if you get the opportunity to speak, if you have a question, just keep it to one question. If it's an idea, just one thought or idea, so that we can get to hear from more people. I start from that corner. I don't know whether that is my brother, Mulandi Malombe, Kenya Human Rights, and uh, then there is Suba Churchill. I'll, I'll take three questions from this column, and then we can move here. So I can see your hands. But let's, let's start with that side. There's uh, Malombe at that corner. There's Suba, and then there's a gentleman at the near the window in yellow. So Malombe then, Suba then, that gentleman at the end. We'll come back. Just one question, please, if you can keep it to 30 seconds, well and good. Thank you. I had a number of reflections, but... Moja tu kwa sasa. One, <laughs> I concur with the Joshua that the obligations uh, given to the president under Article 132, we need to have a way of ensuring that reporting is done according to the Constitution, not making political remarks the same way the president speaks during Mandraka Day, Jamuri Day. So this one has to be very much focused on the obligations in place because that's what we have been lacking. Um, and I think from where I sit, we also need to make uh, human rights a reality, look at how we can also push the human rights policy, which was passed, I think, many years ago. And also the private sector, I think we need to have a national framework on uh, human, rights impact, uh, human rights impacts and also human rights due diligence when it comes to doing business. Because we have so many frameworks which are copied from the West, that one will also enable the private sector to be more human rights centered when it comes to governance of their corporate affairs. Those are my remarks for now. Well, thank you very much, Malombe. We have Suba here. Suba, 30 seconds. Uh, <laughs> you had spoken in the morning as well. <laughs> yes, but on a different thing. Um, when you have a panel of six, um, 30 seconds become too short. But because of the limitation of time, I, I like the, the reflections that um, Changoni has bounced back to us. He has asked very thought-provoking questions. I've asked them before. I'll continue asking them because active is a good Is there a democracy that the young people lack role models? So the question then is how then do we ensure that our children who are coming up are able to be able to turn the tide so that again we are able not to start making some progress towards you now pinning this country together. Thank you. is off. If you promise to keep it to 30 seconds, we can take as many questions. My only concern is that we are taking a bit of time, but if you can just say 30 seconds as we pass on the mic to the next person. The, now that you're there, you can start with this gentleman, and then there is, he, he, had been, he has been putting up his hand as well. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Charles Nyanga from Provident Community Initiative. So I've heard Madam Gloria talking about Kepsa and um, Kenya Daima. And uh, how it is, is it has been working with the government 
in strengthening uh, good governance involving all sectors. Now, there are many reports that the uh, Office of the Auditor General has been presenting. And uh, some of them uh, have painted some counties in a bad light. Yes, in terms of corruption. And uh, my question to Kepsa is, how are they working to reduce that? Thank you. I had another question, but because of time, I'll have to pass. Utaona Gloria Nyumaya tent for that question. The next question, I'm timing actually, so I'll stop you at the 30 seconds. There's a gentleman at the back. I think the hotel should give us those mics in parliament. If you're given two minutes, after two minutes, you end off automatically. 30 seconds to that gentleman. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Agola Jack from Busia County CBC. And my question goes to the National Cohesion and Values um, uh, representative. So I've, from the report that we read with to us, we've, sown, uh, we've, uh, we've seen um, differences in perception and values of the counties uh, we surveying what you're seeing at the national government, whereby uh, we've seen counties uh, have very low values uh, against the approach that is brought in for the national government. I really wish to understand um, what, what exactly has informed this difference in values and how does it affect services? For the counties that showed high values, did it also uh, reflect in, the terms, in terms of uh, service delivery? And then of course, I also want to hear um, the presence of this commission at the county levels. Do we have this commission at the counties? Are we feeling them at counties? Thank you, it thank, you. thank you. I think we've had two, almost. now you're going to the second question, but he's had you, you got him? We've not heard from ladies. I'll move, I'll move to this. Allow me to move this side so that we can, there are more hands here. Thank you, Sheila. I, my name is Sheila Maloba from an organization called Hatua Trust. My question can either go to the Directorate of National Cohesion and Values or uh, Angela uh, representing media. So we've seen uh, the potential of the dig digital space in Kenya and it's been, it has been a good platform for civic empowerment and engagement. However, if we have been observant, and especially this electoral period, Kenyans were attacking each other online. So in terms of values, there's no values. I remember there's... Oh, thank you. Uh, actually, the youths are very desperate, and they were saying categorically they want to go to vote. We see so many deaths of young couple and youths what is our take as, uh, as, as UTU or uh, CSOs? We encourage the CSOs to go deeper, to go deeper to the ground because the youths are killing each other, they are dying. I don't know, I'm posing that question to you. Thank you. Thank you for uh, allowing the girl child's voice to be heard. Martha Nyamo is my name, uh, Women Democracy Network, Kenya chapter. Mine is a remark. Um, I want to recognize what Honorable Patience has said, and I think it's very pertinent to the conversation that we're having. The question she asked was, how do we measure uh, national values? What's the tool that we're using to measure national values, or whether we are meeting the expectations of national values. Because I know even in other conversations when we're, we're, when we're talking about the, my time is up. Oh, sorry, wow, 30 seconds goes fast. Uh, when we're talking about corruption, we never, we, we always say we want to fight corruption, but we never give the measures of how we're going to fight corruption. So for me, I really recognize that, that, and that's the question that maybe we need to continue to ask ourselves is that, what's the measure we are using to gauge ourselves on, are we meeting the expectations of national values so that then it will be the same one that we use for Utu as well. Thank you. Yes, uh, my name is Cynthia Juma and my question go to, goes to our speaker from the Directorate of National Cohesion and Values. What happens when someone takes advantage of our of your values, like 
your principles and values and you do good, as the good book says, continue doing good. But then it, it reaches a point you realize, this person seems to be taking advantage of me. How then do we imply this Utu or do we continue implying this Utu? Uh, thank you. My name is Gloria from uh, Tunaweza Empowerment Organization. I want to uh, ask uh, the mitigation measures that we have to avoid negative profiling of women, especially by the media. Then how do we uh, ensure that we have credible information in terms of the news that we receive? Because recently we saw uh, on the local daily, one of the newspaper, that printed somebody who was actually dead and in two days, the lady was not dead, she was alive, and I was asking myself, could this be the living dead that we hear? Because they came back to apologize and say it was actually wrong. So what is the uh, credibility and the uh, verifiable uh, news that we receive or that we read? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, very quick um, observation and question to Joshua. I'm glad you've mentioned this idea of the State of the Union address. We put it in the Constitution deliberately, and we borrowed that idea from the United States, that the President must address a joint sitting of Congress to state what is the State of the Union in his last five, three, three, six months. Now, if the President deviates from making that address, to address the State of the Union, what is the recourse? Now, maybe you remember when the Speaker of the Congress in the United States felt that the President has deviated from the address of the Union, she took the speech, showed the American people and the whole world, and just told it. Yes, she said, you have not stuck to your mandate, so this speech should not be recorded. I'm not sure whether that is the way to go, but I'm emphasizing that to see the importance of the president sticking to the constitutional provisions of addressing the people of Kenya on the state of the union. I think you need to be a woman, maybe speaker, to be able to take that kind of full action. Thank you. Okay, thanks. I'm Christopher Nyamburi from Kenya National Peace Deaf Women Network. So my question goes to the Registrar of Political Parties. In terms of the points which were listed in terms of the get rich quickly, is there a who to in the office whereby you will find several people are registered in parties where they didn't even register? These people just collect your data. I don't know where they get the ID numbers and everything. Then you will find your name in the system. So for the people with the disability and those who don't have even the smartphones, is there a Hutu for them because they find their details there? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Okaka Rogers, part of the social media team. And uh, my question to the panel would be, uh, for progress to be achieved in the uh, realization of the Hutu, uh, Hutu Niuraya, um, we understand that uh, we had a we had a we, uh, we had a campaign against the new CBC, and uh, part of it was that uh, the Bill of Rights, which uh, actually speaks out uh, to the Utu project, w was actually scrapped off. And uh, this is some of the thing that we were advocating for, being that uh, we grew up even in class six, uh, being taught the Bill of Rights, but now that it's uh, off the table. Uh, wh what is it uh, the panelists will have to do to actually bring back uh, some of these uh, uh, programs? to some of the sessions that we'll be having tomorrow, particularly on issues around women, 
gender. So maybe if we can perhaps look, reflect on some of those uh, tomorrow and just address on the issues that we have spoken on today's session. So I will start with Gloria. I'll start with the people who took less time. <laughs> and then, okay, can pass it. So Gloria, just one and a half minutes respond to the specific question that was asked and then give your closing comments. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, we agreed that we meet behind the tent, but it was a very good question. What are we doing at the county level where there's so much that is happening? What I can say as a, uh, from KEPSA is we've already formed a round table forum with the Council of Governors. In fact, two days ago, well, there was a meeting that is going to speak to that. And in KEPSA believes in dialogue. And it uh, believes in sharing our values and sharing what we have w during those stakeholder forums. So this is something that we are going to raise. We do dialogue as our, our tool. And I believe that putting this across is not going to be difficult going forward. We have seen in the last 10 years or the last five years, there is a lot of that that has come on. And somebody talked about, is this translating? If, if, if a county adheres to good governance, is it translating to better business? Is it translating to de better development? I think those are uh, questions that we are going to take up and probably even do a research to inform us as we move forward. Um, Lastly, I just want to underscore that KEPSA is committed to issues of Utu. It is completely converted that unless we have good governance, then we can't have good business. And we'll continue adhering to that. Mm. I didn't speak to the issues of children. We talk, we also ensure that, or try to ensure that businesses comply to better environment for children. I know children don't come to the offices, but they come to the offices through their parents. Asante. Thank you very much, Gloria. If we can go to patients, your last points, and responding to some of the questions asked. Thank you so much, Sheila. Well, I would like to look at it from a, uh, a consumer perspective. As citizens, we also have a role to play. You're allowed to call out media when you feel like we are reporting without Utu or dignify, uh, without the respect of national values. The Media Council of Kenya, which regulates the conduct of media and journalists, we work together as the Association of Media Women in Kenya, and together we want to say that we will remain committed to national values. We remain committed to ensuring that our report in our reportage we value Utu and national values. And then how do we ensure credibility and uh, support of verifiable news. As it is now, and of course we blame this on the um, digital era where we are, there's a lot of misinformation, there's a lot of misrepresentation of facts. We are in a digital era, news fly fast. We say gossip and fake news fly even faster. So the media people are feeding into the social media because you cannot be everywhere. Many, so many media houses do not have correspondent or do not have reporters in all the places. So a lot of the time now they have desks that are monitoring the social media platforms and trying to see where, what is happening where. And sometimes they are uh, you know, reporting news as they are being reported by citizens. So it's your duty again as a citizen. If you find there is misinformation of news, please report it as fast as you can. It's our responsibility as citizens. And therefore, as media, I want to say that uh, we will continue to remain committed and champion of enhancing a dignified society and a society that, re that re respects Utu. Yeah, thank you. In line with uh, Section 4 of the Political Parties Act, it is the sole responsibility of the political parties to recruit members, not the office of the registrar of political parties. The key word is not. As an office also, we have come up with three mechanisms to ensure that Kenyans do not find themselves in parties they never joined. There are three ways, one, through IPPMS, that is Integrated Political Party Management System, and of course, you can also use your e-citizen account 
and finally the code star you can you can uh, i'm looking at you star 509 ash star 509 ash uh, using that code you can be able to know um uh, the party that you belong as i said as a kenyan no political party has a right to register you without your consent that's in line with the data protection act of 2019 as we speak now before registering any political party we seek the consent of all the 24,000 members we send to them messages they have to confirm in writing whether they truly belong to that political party thank you yes i think i had uh, two questions the first question was uh, what can we do if the youth lacks role models and i feel all of us we have a responsibility in this uh, because the disconnect of our families the youth has no one to talk to i think it's high time we create some programs where we can uh, engage the young people into the utu discussion for them to see the purpose of living as young people uh, the second question was about the youth being disparate on uh, uh, voting uh, because most young people they don't want to vote uh, I, I think uh, we we need to know that voting need to be versus services and the young people are, are disparate because they have been voting people who are not really helping them on uh, to overcome what they are uh, expecting from them and for me the solution in this i think it's a high time uh, we start early voter education and civic education uh, because we don't have to wait for two months before election for us to start engaging communities uh, or the young people but if we can start this conversation early i think it will reduce the apathy in voting and all that thank you so much thank you very much evans joshua okay thank you very much um, moderator um i have i think i'll respond to two questions and then make my closing remarks so how do we measure national values? That's a very important question. And uh, I am aware that they directed as a framework uh, where each of um, you know, the government departments give reports. Uh, we have also a shadow framework from CRECO, and uh, I think I'll be delighted to share with the organizers of this forum so that it can be shared with the participants here, uh, with the key uh, areas of um, you know, determination and measurement um, uh, and I think that's something that we can, uh, you know, share. And we got, I don't want to repeat the issue of negative profiling and disinformation. I think um, our, my colleagues here have, ma have mentioned on that. But just to affirm that disinformation and misinformation is a monster, is now the devil in our public communication. And I think that is also something that we need to confront. And the major spreader of disinformation and misinformation is government. It's actually a business. And they used it in B on BBI. And we ended up getting duped into all that. You saw all our county assemblies uh, getting duped in all those things, including the vehicles and all those things. That's disinformation and misinformation. And media became also a victim. And then on the state of the nation address, I think, Ambassador, you've mentioned this. And for me, I think the separation of powers provided by the Constitution was really a safeguard of this. But the problem we are seeing currently under this new regime is pathetic. Parliament is under the ambits of the executive. We saw recently in the Yala nominations, uh, the committee chairs in Parliament, both Senate and the um, National Assembly, and then the cabinet secretaries. And I think this is something we need to confront. Then um, my colleagues in the sector, Suba and the Comrade Malombe, uh, I want to wrap up that session by saying that if you want to see our mirror, let's also see our colleagues from civil society who have crossed to government. Currently, we have six cabinet secretaries. When you saw on the public uh, TV interviews, they owe their background in terms of their profession on civil society. Look at them in the mirror. That is how we are. We are in cabinet, we are in parliament, we are everywhere. That is the mirror of who we truly are. And then my last parting shots. I think, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welfare for the sector is an issue that we can no longer 
uh, um, um, you know, postpone to discuss. We have a lot of welfare issues in the sector. And that is also in line of the lenses of Utu. Uh, the last bit is, I think, when we look at citizen participation, I really plead with you, like, let's look at these three lenses, and I would want to use from the expertise that is in this room. Professor Miriam Were challenged us when we were launching the Utu book, the one that is on the table, and she said, why do we invest a lot in uh, curative health care when we can spend a lot of money in what's called preventive health care? I mean, kwashogo, or what you call this, malaria? I mean, we can fight all these mosquitoes. I mean, and we don't need to go to hospital. But of course, you know, our healthcare system has been driven with what's called procurement for what? Tenders, eh? So that people get money. Then the last bit, uh, Madam Moderator, I'm so sorry about, and this not being in discipline, is food sovereignty. I mean, as a society, I mean, why do we still have people who don't have, uh, you know, food? When we have people who have food rotting in their stores, they have no market to take. I mean, what is the problem? Then the last bit, water access. You know, in this town, there is artificial water shortages because of people who would want to woo people that they are so, uh, so much in Utu, they even, they philanthropic, that is the word, Oliver. They bring the water bosses uh, for women to get water free of charge and they clap for that particular person to say this is now the savior, while that is the same person who created artificial water, what? Shortage. And it's now rampant in the country. It's not longer in Nairobi. Just it's in Eldoret, in Kisumu, everywhere. Thank it's a serious uh, you know, issue. I, I let you go on because of the passion with which you execute your responses. But finally, Mr. Wafula. Thank you. I think there were two or three issues I can respond to. Uh, first, let me acknowledge that uh, the State of the Nation address, I think the remarks by the President uh, appear to point to the scorecard of what government has done. Uh, however, Article 132 of the Constitution says the President shall address, and what that's what you hear him give the speech, but he's also required to uh, gazette. And what he does is actually he tables a report to Parliament, and he makes a speech. That report he tables, and that report which is gazetted uh, by the government uh, printer, actually is all about measures taken and values that have been driven and how that has done. But I think uh, a working relationship between perhaps ourselves and the media will do well here to highlight so that what comes across for debate and discussion across the country should be, the focus should be on national values and not so much on what the president said in terms of what his government has done as a scorecard. Number two, there was a point uh, about the survey findings that uh, portrayed the counties as not doing as well as the national government in terms of uh, national values indicators. I think that is what the survey found. The only explanation can be that perhaps the county governments are recently established and government, national government has a longer life and perhaps that is where uh, levels of awareness and information and uh, just Uzoevu uh, can make the difference. How that relates to uh, service delivery, I think is another research that we need to find out. Then number last, there was, uh, I think, uh, an aspect of enforcement, the question of uh, abuse of the digital platform in terms of uh, incitement messages, and there was also an observation about if your rights are being violated or if how long can you bear with this. I think those are aspects of enforcement, and we have an act on uh, regarding information which can uh, be addressed, uh, I think, legally. As I close, I think, uh, but of course, in terms of enforcement, uh, in terms of uh, values and cohesion, there are institutions responsible for that, including the NCIC, which has regulations and uh, staff that do enforcement, which I think can well address that. Uh, in conclusion, I want to say, uh, Article 10.1 says that the values and principles bind all. It begins with state officers, state institutions, and all persons. And therefore, the enforcement of this and the realization of this must be an all a collective responsibility. We should all, like uh, my colleague said, just look ourselves in the mirror and say, what has been my contribution? We are happy with what other government agencies have done, the judiciary in terms of passing sentences. We have seen national values being cited as one of the areas that have been violated. 
we are happy the education, the CBC curriculum has recognized values as one of the competencies to be developed. And we are happy with the, like the COG receiving complaints and uh, uh, intervening to ensure that service delivery is not interrupted, which is in line with national values. Thank and you. therefore it's a, a challenge to all of us yeah. in whichever office we sit uh, to make our contribution to make national values a reality. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Fuller. Please join me in appreciating the panelists. We've had a very rich panel, <laughs> multisectoral. Uh, there are a lot of views that have come. I hope that they are being noted down somewhere in terms of recommendations, uh, possibly feeding into the next steps after this conference. Very, very rich discussions, questions on our civil society as well, thought-provoking uh, reflections. Uh, what we need to do even in terms of behavior change, there's talks about, you know, poor parent parenting, there's a deficit of role models, we are a society of individualism, you know, media when it comes to reporting, do we need to train our media on issues around uh, national values, uh, how do we enhance the code of conduct for media as well uh, to reflect that, uh, questions around the youth and the problem that youth don't get these opportunities, and so we also have to look at the question around abuse of power, abuse of resources, even as we talk about how do you reform the youth and why do they engage in ways that maybe we, we, we in, in terms of what we are seeing uh, as a trends. Presidential state of the nation from what Malombe and, 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 and Ambassador and Joshua, your feedback, perhaps something that could come from this conference is can we then work on en enforcing this and compelling the president to give us, you know, when he comes to speak to us as a state of the nation, you know, make sure that you are giving us an, uh, a report on Article 10 and, 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 and uh, we have a new regime. How can we change uh, that particular trend and culture around the reporting of national values and principles of governance? I've written pages and pages of recommendations that have come from this uh, uh, session. I don't want to repeat now because if I do, then I'll not be, I'll not be acting in a manner reflecting what you want to achieve from this conference, promoting a culture of Utu. And sorry, if I've not given you the opportunity to speak, I'm sorry if that was contrary to what we are trying to create here, a culture of Utu, but I'm also thinking that if we don't end this conversation, then we will not be able to start the afternoon sessions on time, we will not be able to uh, complete and conclude and get to see and hear other, other discussions. So my apologies, Kamani me kurab, uh, the, the wrong way, but it is in all our interests that we just are able to conclude on time. And also because there's a lady here harassing me, Olivia, while I was cutting you guys short, she was also cutting me short. So blame her, not me. But thank you very much <laughs> and have a good lunch break. Maybe Olivia, you'll come and give us the way forward for the lunch. Yes, but thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. You may take your seats. Thank you. Uh, first, I would start by appreciating Sheila. Um, she started off with 20 minutes less for her session, and she has actually finished on time. Um, I think that is uh, Utu. Uh, she is leading by example, because we requested her to try and ensure that she finishes on time, though she started 20 minutes late. Uh, we appreciate you, and your moderation was really good and appreciated. Everybody, every speaker that was on stage, again, we want to appreciate you for the great insights that you've given to us. I have a question, but I'll ask it when we start our afternoon session. And uh, right now, I'd like to tell us that we will be back at 2, at exactly 2. Please do not stay long at uh, lunch. We are going for lunch right now, and we come back at exactly 2. So the direction still, just like yesterday, we do the hotel tour. Get into the lift, get to third floor, turn right, turn left, get into another lift, get to first floor, look for the restaurant. Okay? It will give you an opportunity to talk to your colleagues and probably the, the hotel uh, staff. Now, I have a lost and found. Um, I don't know who this is. Please, if it is yours, uh, find me and pick it. And uh, finally, uh, one more announcement. If you have not received a meal voucher, they will be given to you as you exit. And um, uh, please, for everyone who hasn't registered, remember to pass by the registration desk and register. Thank you. Um, I would like to request you to lead us in a word of prayer for lunch.
Let's pray for lunch. Father, thank you for the morning session that has gone by. We uh, now pray that, Lord, you'd bless the lunch that uh, we are about to partake. Uh, may it be of good use to our bodies. And we also remember many of our people who are living in places that they do not have plenty to eat. Lord, even in our deliberations, help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's go for lunch. Two p.m. Um, the psyche of Kenyans is something very interesting to listen to and to discuss because that is where all the utuness then is supposed to be directed. Because um, I believe that utu is supposed to be learned. As we wait for Mufasa, let me say that utu is something that can be learned and can be unlearned. And uh, if we want to talk about utu, I believe we need to inculcate this from childhood, from the education of our children, some values and belief systems that we grow up with. And as we grow into politicians, then we know that this already was in our upbringing. It was already something that we learned from our parents and our teachers. And when we get into politics and we get into leadership, then we will have value-based leadership. We will have good governance, and that will follow. Cliff, can you confirm where or what's going on? They're coming. Thank you so much. Today, I, w I was hoping that we will finish at exactly 4.30. And I believe that will happen because we have not eaten a lot into our time. Again, we've just taken uh, 25 minutes. I know our moderator will, 27 minutes, will help us uh, recover that.
knocking on the doors, the doors of freedom. I'm knocking on the door, the doors of freedom, freedom of the mind, freedom of the soul, freedom of the mind, freedom of the soul. I'm knocking on the door, doors of freedom, and I'm knocking on the door, doors of freedom, freedom of the mind, freedom of the soul, freedom of the mind. Freedom of the soul. The world today is about numbers. It's a numbers game. The youth are not playing, they are paying for the game. My understanding is people who stand for the youth stand on the youth, but the youth have no stand. It's a country of haves and have nots. People who have the notes have the note to take from the youth, then pay the youth to lie they have what they don't have. If Kirinyaga is rising, why are young people paid to tweet about it? Every morning the sun rises and no one asks us to tweet about it because we can all see it. <laughs> see, nothing is like it used to be. Radio lost the rhythm and we don't go out to get air and play. In fact, the rap game done changed, not just the beat, they lack the beat where they've got something to say. Keshaka would make us come alive, but now we're just leaving a beat. Today, Mao is falling, the rivers are leaving, the weather is faulting, and contrary to what we were told, the future is not in our hands. What we have is a phone with features. While we were still on Instagram, they were stealing our geography features, no playgrounds, just buildings. So if babies cannot be babies, then don't blame them for cussing, for hanging onto a phone instead of hanging onto a swing. I mean, all these leaders we have, Yet the only science we know is to dissolve after five years. But when will we become a solution? If we build roads without sidewalks, then how does a country make steps if it literally doesn't care about where the people step? You see, people who steal will need pace to run into hiding. Except when you're the first president, or the second, or elected, or appointed, you can claim you're starting something new and cause damage like never seen before. After all, isn't that how they describe the boy who jumped into State House? Remember? They call him disturbed, they call him damaged, as if to call him jobless, to call him angry, to call him neglected youth would not make news. And newspapers need news to make news. So maybe the next time they will call him a zombie. They will call him a maniac. They will call him a walking dead. Vision 2030 is walking dead, a dodge, a eulogy, praising the future already dead to us. I'm not saying our leaders are uncanny. I'm saying our leaders will come collect votes at your funeral. They will use a body in a coffin to resurrect their ambition. How did we get here? So don't tell me we of the Writers Club should never write pages that will cause stars, that will host stars starring as Thomas Sankara, Gugi Watyongo, Yash Palgai, Wangari Madai, Mlalif Savzai, Chalakam Tai, Brother Parks, Nazmi, Mahatma Gandhi, Stibi Kotombe, Matazma Tlu, the Tim Jamuge, Wadongo, Rupa, we of the Poetry Tribe will write pieces that will draw the sun to send its rays to enlighten folks in villages, women in corridors, thugs in offices, bullies in schools, guns in peace missions, visionaries in social halls. In fact, clap, clap, for DJs won't retire and continue to make up words like Rabba Dabba Do. This is for you to bring back songs of revolution, songs like in a Zakana, Kana songs, Kahizo, because ours is not a revolution of gun and violence. Ours is a revolution of the mind, spirit, and energy. I'm knocking on the doors, <laughs> the doors of freedom. I'm knocking on the doors, the doors of freedom. Freedom of the mind. Freedom of the soul. Come on, Ashley. Said freedom of the mind. Freedom of the soul. And I'm knocking on the door. Doors of freedom. And I'm knocking on the door. 
doors of freedom you need freedom of the mind freedom of the soul freedom of the mind freedom of the soul Actually, tell them. You have to help me sing it. You know the words, yeah? You've been well fed. You have been well fed. <laughs> you have to help me sing. Say, freedom of the mind. Freedom of the mind. Freedom of the mind. Guys, give me some energy, please. Please, guys. <laughs> I said, freedom of the mind, freedom of the mind, freedom of the mind, freedom of the mind, freedom of the soul, freedom of your being, freedom of the mind, freedom of the mind. Said I'm knocking on the doors, the doors of freedom, and I'm banging on the doors. I'm banging on the doors. Said I'm banging on the doors, doors of freedom, freedom of the mind, freedom of the soul. Freedom of the mind, freedom of the soul, freedom of the mind, freedom of the soul. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for that piece, Ashley and Musafa. Freedom of the mind, freedom of our souls, freedom of our beings. And we have to bang the doors. I was just reflecting over lunchtime that maybe as civil society, we haven't done well in, uh, in succession. We have people like Okia Omtata, and many who are also represented here, who, who we know were in the struggle. But as we exit the stage, have we prepared our young people to take over? So that's something we, are, we, we, we could reflect on. And I want to welcome you to this afternoon as we, we talk about freedom of the mind. Uh, we are moving into the psyche of Kenyans systemic interventions to realizing nationhood. And also, under this, we are looking at issues of how transformative is our education and is our education system value-based. I think we've had a bit of discussions, even from this morning, about our education and the education sector. We have agreed that uh, for this session, what we do, we have all the speakers 
who are addressing us in the afternoon. So we have those in the education sector, and then also the role of faith-based organizations in inculcating values in, in society so that we can manage our time more efficiently and, uh, and, 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 and don't stretch it too far. So I'm going to call the two uh, panels together, but uh, you will address your sessions. So the first, our first speaker is Boaz Waruku from the National Integrity Alliance. And uh, we know Waruku as one of the founders or the founding chairman of Uraya Trust. Please welcome Mr. Boaz Waruku to the platform. I am not sure I've done him enough justice, but uh, he says those two will suffice for now. But if, if we always talk about fathers of civil society, then I think he will be one of them. If we have to write the history of civil society in Kenya, we cannot write without Boaz Waruku. Please welcome. <laughs> and then my second speaker, um, Andio Obondo. Andio Obondo also has been in this sector uh, you choose any, you choose where you feel comfortable. And Wandio, Andiwo is an educationist. He's been involved in grant management, monitoring evaluation, governance. He's an advocacy expert with over 25 years experience, both in government and civil society and in donor communities. Currently, he's the monitoring evaluation and learning mentor or coach with Rally Africa and strategy and policy advisor at CRI East Africa. Please welcome Mr. Andiwo Obondo. Are you ready here? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Andiwo's presentation is going to be done in collaboration with Professor Sheila Wamahio, who is also an educationist, gender and child rights advocate and research, currently director of Just Lika. She has over 40 years diverse experience in Kenya and beyond, including academia, the UN, and civil society. She has a PhD in education and a master's in anthropology. Please welcome Professor Wamahio. I then would like to call upon, um, I'm not sure if I've seen Dr. Warari. I, I don't, I, I hadn't seen him, but let me start um, with uh, Sheikh Hassan Olenado, the chair, Supreme Council of Kenya, Muslim, Supkem. Um, he also has a, a, a history, having worked in civil society and in governance, uh, particularly in, uh, Extensive, in, you know, extens extensive experience in prevention of violence and extremism, and also in peace building. Please join me in welcoming Sheikh Olenado. Please welcome at, at the podium. And then I also call on Reverend Father Samuel Mwaniki, Caritas Director, Catholic Diocese of Nyahururu. Please let's give him a hand. And also, I now want to call Reverend Canon Peter Adolwa, um, who is the, is the vicar, the vicar in charge of Christ Church in Westlands. He's a social justice expert with work for over 20 years, community service at Lovington United, founder member Hatua Trust. Please welcome Canon Adolwa. So we will start with Andiwo and Sheila. And uh, each one of you, if I, if, oh, we start with Boaz. Boaz is setting the pace for us. Just take 10 minutes. As we agreed in the morning, we are challenging ourselves to 
to, 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 to understand this concept. So if we just stick to 10 minutes so that we can have more discussion from plenary, that will be great. Thank you very much. Shukran sana. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good after lunch. How was lunch? How was lunch? It was too much. Thank you very much. Uh, because of a shortage of time, and thanks for those who have ensured that as we come here, we find this. Uh, I think that oath is already taken. Um, hello? Are we together? Yes. I said I think, I, I hope the oath is already taken. <laughs> okay. I hope you know what I'm carrying, eh? The Constitution of the Republic of Kenya. When I see it, I think I feel nice here. Because all these guys, all of you ensure that it came to fruition. Education at the heart of the matter. Kenyans are celebrating a very democratic, robust, very um, elaborate or a, a comprehensive framework that allows them to be effective participants in the management of their lives. That constitution itself does not work if you and me are not active in it. For you and me to be active, one aspect or one instrument that must be found right is the education of the country. Education system, the curriculum, and all that. And that is why I'm privileged to share this podium with eminent fellows here, just to discuss with you briefly about the nature of education as is and what it should be. Um, from the Uto lens, we are looking at how value laden the education system should be. And it's captured in our very, very principled uh, position or uh, statement that we say, we only look at education for responsible and productive citizenship. If anybody is delivering any education that is devoid of responsibility and that is devoid of productivity, that person is delivering something which is totally different. So we start by indicating that uh, the framework that colleagues uh, have been consulting on on the NEET platform is one that places education at the center of all development processes. And when we say so, it cannot be anything if that education has got n uh, uh, no Utu ideals. For it to be an education that embraces the Utu uh, ideals, it must put three things into place. One, it must state uh, categorically that education is a basic human right. It must state that education is a basic human right, it is a public good, and it should be pro provided to all citizens of this country, regardless of the region they come from, regardless of abilities or different abilities, because we have challenges in uh, accessing education, just because some of us happen to be uh, persons with disabilities, that this education includes everyone, and starting particularly with the girl child, because education that does not target the girl child is not an education for the nation. And that this education should, should start from that infancy, and it is lifelong. It goes through the adulthood. It start from, starts from the crib to the grave. So um, with that kind of a context, then I would reflect starting with what really ails the education in this country. Um, you know that Kenya, being uh, is a worthy member of the UN and all that, 
the fact that Kenya was among the countries that signed on to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. That declaration in itself recognized education, isn't it? Uh, in its Article 26, it fundamentally states that education is a human right and everyone has got that right to access that education. It shall be free, at least in the elementary and fundamental stages. And it actually says that elementary and fundamental stages, which we have coached to be basic education, should be, uh, I'm using those, but I'll, I'll be explaining a little bit beyond it. That fundamental and elementary stage should be the basic uh, education cycle, which should be at least 12 years of continuous learning. In Kenya, 12 years of continuous learning takes us to To which, which grade, which level? Yeah, uh, the, to, uh, form four. And so it is important that we take that into consideration. And technical and the professional education, uh, all this should make, be made generally available at the high, uh, and, and the higher education be also made accessible uh, to all on the basis of merit. And this is one aspect that we should also be uh, recasting very much. Uh, the, it attempts to define also the fundamentals within education and the fact that uh, education is supposed to be uh, enabling us to uh, evolve, the f to realize the full development of the human personality. Uh, I think this one is an anchorage that sits squarely onto what we within uh, NEET have been discussing and saying, so what is the philosophy that then we can, uh, uh, we, we can agree to, which we can say should be the philosophy, philosophical foundation that drives education in this country. So uh, I will not go into the details of which other instruments actually already provide and articulate uh, for education as a basic uh, fundamental human right, but I'll simply say that we can make references to the International Covenant on Social and Economic Rights and even in Africa, I think we know that uh, the, we have the uh, human right, the, the, the human rights charter, which articulates a lot about the education. Uh, but it is also important for us to remember that as um, education was being, uh, I mean, planned in the subsequent phases from the pre from the colonial period to the immediate post-colonial era. The philosophy of this education is something that we utterly missed. How many of us remember why or, or how the mobilization for people to go to school was being done? You are being told that let's go to school so that you can do what? What, would, what were you supposed to achieve once you've gone to school? I just, just a quick, quick, quick one, two. Utapata kazi, aha. Utakuwa? Mwalimu, aha. You can be the leaders of tomorrow, and uh, if it is written, be the leaders of tomorrow. The youth people, when I train, I write them, be the leaders of tomorrow. Because when we come here tomorrow, we'll still read that. Eh? Uh -huh. What else? So that you can be rich. Thank you. Let me pick only one on utapata kazi. Nikazigani, your uh, education at that level was only meant to enable you to be literate functionally, not, not that functional, but to be able to read meters so that you can be a meter reader and employed by the city council. It was not supposed to engage your ma mental uh, 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 setup so that you can be more productive, you can be more, even more philosophical, you can be more understanding on the environment that you are uh, involved in. So we actually ended up by producing semi-literate fellas who thought that they were well-educated and learned. I had a head teacher who used to say, when you come here, don't just think that what we give you in class is sufficient. This is an environment for learning. Get what you, you get here. Go to the library, interact with the workers, 
interact with other leaders, interact with other stakeholders, so that you are an all-rounder. You get to absorb what really should be absorbed by somebody who has gone through this school. We do not want you to remember that when you went through this school, the outcome of it is just this certificate. Because there are people with certificates in place, but the productivity is wanting. The all-roundness of developing that person has really been uh, missed. So uh, it is important then to get it right, that if at the independent stage we simply transitioned and talked largely about education for work, uh, education that would make you become leaders of tomorrow, but then we finally realized that that kind of education took us through uh, how many years before 2010? That is a period or an era or cumulative of errors, and in this case, I'm putting double R and O and R. <laughs> so those errors that we had, the era of Kenyatta one, the era of Kenyatta two, presided over by Moi, era of Kenyatta three, presided over by Kibaki, era of Kenyatta four, presided over by Kenyatta uh, Kamwana, error of Kenyatta V presided of by Bill Ruto. I'm saying that because, you see, if all the, that accumulation of errors cannot take us back to where education should have taken us, because that period has witnessed, I'll give an example of why I'm calling them children because they are being displaced. Even killings happen there, so that should not happen. Uh, I think because uh, the, uh, the other things that we must look at and all that is the financing aspect. The financing, I want to only leave you with the four S's on the financing. We have resources in this country. We can generate a lot more resources so that the budget that we are talking about can be increased. So let's bake a lot more of the bread so the share of the budget should be increased. The second thing is that when we get that budget, we must share it equitably, and education should be a priority. Kenya has uh, ratified all these instruments. At least 20% of that budget annually should go to education. The other thing is that we must be very, very sensitive when we allocate it, because not everybody requires the same kind of resources. Education uh, experts will tell you that the resources you require to educate a girl is not necessarily the same that you require for a boy. A child with disability is not the same as the so which must be costed in an, a way that would be sensitive to all those. And even in the far-flung areas where insecurity becomes a problem, you, you must factor in that. And then finally, scrutiny, so that we do not allocate resources we do which are then pilfered which the corrupt, corruption cartels take away. And so, um, ladies and gentlemen, if we want to get it right, and I've skipped a number of things, if we want to get it right, let us go to the foundations. Education for what? And when we are planning that education, you cannot plan that education minus the teacher. Anybody telling you that it will be right when the planning is wrong is a lie. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you can just take your seat until we finish uh, the session on education. I now want to call on our, uh, 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 Obondo and uh, Dr. Sheila. I don't know how you, Professor Sheila, I'm not sure how you have organized. And uh, we'll give you 15 minutes I, I, between the two of you. I hope you can manage. We'll try. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for promoting me to a professor. I know my colleagues from the universities won't be happy with that. Um, so we had a presentation. I don't know. Um,
one, the getting ready. No, they, they have it there. I'll go, I'll go through quickly, I'll tell them. So um, I think they're a little bit worried because our slides are many, but we won't use all the slides. Because what we've been hearing from, what I've been hearing since morning, I think uh, those issues that have been raised and also been raised by my brother Boaz here actually gave us a very good foundation. Um, this is working? Okay. So um, thank you so much, Helen, once again, and good afternoon. Uh, this is a, this, what I'm presenting today is the product of thinking together, not only thinking together between Andiwo and myself, or between CRI and Jaslika, but it's thinking together for many, many other people. We, there was a question raised that there's a, the presidential, um, what is working uh, group, the working group is there. We have not done a presentation there. But prior to that, you know, we have institutional memory. Memory is a bit faulty. There was also the Fatuma Chege Task Force, which also did exactly what this group is doing. So we're duplicating a lot of things. And in that uh, forum, we did a presentation. We did a position paper on value-based education. So that's very relevant for us today. And that paper carried the voices of children of young people, of teachers, some teachers, of course we don't have resources like the unions and others, but some teachers, many civil society organizations and individuals. And we are going to um, uh, present part of that, but also a lot of research, the voices of people who entrusted the voices to us through the kind of qualitative research, participatory research, that we do. Um, more th we're talking about three, 4,000 people uh, in terms of the research voices that we reached out to parents, faith-based organizations, and children, children, and children, and teachers. Because education is about children. Without children, there's no education. And about teachers who, even with technology, we still need teachers. So those are the voices we are carrying very strongly. Uh, if you can please move on. So we are going to focus on today, I will give you um, some insights, and then Andiwo will come in to give our recommendations. So we, have, we are doing this presentation in five parts. We are talking about the Kiondo, and you might wonder, what does the Kiondo have to do with Ubuntu and value-based education? And we are then going to s anchor value-based education in both the past and the present uh, developments, and then look at the difference, the gap between theory and practice. There's a huge gap between theory. What Boaz was talking about, the, the world declarations and um, all these treaties and instruments, that's, those are the theory, and very important because those are things, th those give us the inspiration to achieve a certain goal. So that's what we're trying to achieve, but what is on the ground? That is what research tells us, and our experiential knowledge tells us, and then the recommendations. And the final words, we might skip it because, uh, is it Joshua? Joshua actually used the words I was going to use, he quoted me uh, in his presentation, so we'll skip that to make more time for it. So let's move on to what we're saying. Um, sorry, that's the Kiondo. So what does the Kiondo have to do with it? So in our position paper, we conceptualize nurturing of values as uh, the process of weaving a Kiondo. I don't have time to go into details, but this weaving process, it's a process, right? And it, it has many, the threads remain until the end. I think it's called warps. And those warps is what we are calling our core values. And if you have the time, you can go to the website and you can look at how we explain it. 
But one more important thing about the Kyondo, um, and in that paper we actually talked about the tradition Kyondo, which encapsulates the concept of Ubuntu. What uh, Dr. Michel, Michel, she talked about in the morning, Utu or Ubuntu, and that is what we talked about in that position paper. I am because we are. And in the sense, it teaches respect, responsibility, and the need to cultivate peaceful coexistence, among other things. But also we chose the Kiondo because it highlights women and women's roles in this whole process of nurturing values uh, in traditional Africa. So we anchored ourselves in traditional Africa. Now, coming to the present, if we look at what is this, we're talking about CBC now, the value-based education anchored in. There's the Constitution. I don't want to talk about it more. A lot of us have talked about it. There's the basic education curriculum framework and the CBC curriculum uh, design. And one of my favorite lines from the basic education curriculum framework, which I hope some of you will read if you have not read it, it is to nurture learners who do the right thing because it is the right thing to do. Not because, and I like Andy who added a line to that, because, not because somebody's looking, not because of fear. That is the basic education curriculum framework. And it talks about a values pillar. It has guiding principles and core competencies. In the interest of time, I won't go into details. But what I would like to point out here is that the CBC curriculum design, um, I, I wished that they had worked a little bit more on it in terms of the values that they have singled out. And those values, I wouldn't say they're not values, they're values, but to leave out values of equality, equity, justice, non-discrimination, yes, they're principles. The curriculum framework has that, but the values we are saying that sh our children should learn in the classroom, they've left out things that are very, very critical. And what way we see the divide that we were talking about. Now, the four insights on VBE that I will, I'll share from the research. One is that core values are foundational. And this is socialization uh, that takes place at the home, in the community, and also in the schools, the more formalized institutions. There's also that values is a process, learning is a process. It is a journey that begins from life to death. It is experiential, participatory learning, nurturing and reinforcing uh, lived values. And I would like to emphasize this here. This is not anything new. This is what was there in African traditional uh, education. That experiential learning, that freedom to learn through exploring the environment. Those things were there, but it is. We talk about as if we've got it from the West. No, it was in our traditions. So let's look at what was positives in our tradition and uh, how we uh, move ahead. And also that learning was non-linear. Learning was generational. Remember they talked about the wisdom of the aged, wisdom of people with my gray hair, for example. But also learning was peer-to-peer. -peer. You know, the initiation groups, the Rika. You know, th you learned, and in the play groups, you learn from each other. So that was a very important principle in value learning. And finally, that it was seamless. Uh, you know, I'm a lecturer, I can lose, type, uh, lose track of time. Now, coming more to the present, though it was, uh, is the opportunities for nurturing values, which is in the classroom, school, family, and community level. I will not describe it at this point because I think people have touched upon it. And what I would like to remind people that apart from the indigenous Africa, even in our formal curriculum, there have been past attempts to introduce value-based education. If we look at the Gashati report of 1976, a very progressive document, 
It introduced something called social education and ethics in 1985, but they made it, they killed it. Let me just say, it was a beautiful curriculum, not the, not the books that were produced by KIE, with all apologies if there's anybody here from KICC today, but there were, it was a very good curriculum that was killed by making it examinable, by actually printing, because I reviewed some of these books, actually, factually incorrect things because of whoever's own ideology. You know, when we are not able to separate our ideology from uh, the facts and what values should be. So that was a good one. And then we also had life skills education and, uh, at different times, 1990s, uh, 2008, but with what success? No, you can say with what success we see the leaders. And I'll rest my case with that because I don't want to go into that. We've seen our leaders who went through these systems. It clearly did not help to instill values. Now VBE has integrated into the curriculum design for lower primary, but with what success? Somebody asked the question of teachers. Teachers don't have time to positive values to teach in the classroom. Teachers don't know how to teach or nurture positive values. Boys raised that issue. You know, we, we, they, have, they have a lot of experiential knowledge, but has that been tapped into? Or have they been put into a box? And I'm a teacher myself, so I'm asking that question. There's a huge gap between theory and practice. And when I talk about positive values and negative values, I know KICD was up in arms against me for talking about positive values and negative values. What we heard in the morning about our definition of success, to me, that's a negative value. Because children will learn. My friends from Usawa, Agenda, and Uezu, they will ask the question, are our children learning? I would say yes, in the context of values they're learning. But maybe they're not learning what they should learn. They're learning the negative things. If we go to the next, yeah, uh, theory versus practice, to me, the positive values are the constitutional values, which are humanistic, they're universal values. They're the yardstick with which we should measure. And that does not mean, and I think in the morning that was discussed, that the concept of Utu is also humanistic. So those are the <coughs> things we should look at. And the negative values, the lack of integrity, intolerance, uh, lack of empathy, exclusion, fear, because we define respect to mean fear, and violence and unethical behavior. Now, I had two, two examples of uh, children's voices, which I will not read in the interest of time, but it really describes, sometimes I say, some of our schools are like torture chambers. And those of you who have been through schools, you know the kind of punishments you receive. But I'll summarize that. Uh, because they have loads and loads and loads of example of what goes on in our schools. But the point I want to make, violence breeds violence. In our schools, the kind of discipline that we use, in the name of discipline, mm -hmm. we beat children black and blue. We humiliate them. So here is, I'm just summarizing some of the issues that's raised in the voices that violence, like pinching and slapping, is very common. Beating, using pipes, phone chargers, dusters, spanking, kicking, boxing, banging the child against the wall, and collective punishment. All teachers participating in collective punishment. And this is something we've seen that our security uh, apparatus doing. They go to a place and they use collective punishment. They decide, Andiwo is a terrorist which may not even be the correct position, but they decide to burn down his whole village. Where are we learning? These are colonial practices. It was not indigenous Africa that did that. These are, and there's research that I've done and others have done that shows the connection between colonial practices and what we today take to be our values and norms and the right thing to do, and it is not the right thing to do. I can see that uh, he Helen is coming up. So I will not uh, just go to the next slide very quickly. I will not talk about it, but just shows, no, the next one, uh, the, the other one on the, just the images. 
just the images. Yeah, I don't know how clear it is. But it just shows our politicians behaving badly, our, our lawyers, legal fraternity behaving badly, and the fire, children behaving badly. And it's all connected to that violence breeds violence. And until we can break that cycle of violence in our classrooms, we are not going to succeed. Because that's, uh, maybe I take one more second, a minute. That is, I'll skip the next slide because that is, uh, people have talked about it from a research, but well, I don't want to go away with people thinking that we don't have schools that are value-based. The schools are there because of the leadership in the school, because of the teachers in the school who have taken individual decisions to make sure that the school is protective. The school, all children are also learning positive things. And it's amazing how some of these teachers, and it's based on a study that I've done on positive deviance, how, how these teachers with very little resources are able to make the school into a joyful school where children are learning and recognizing that not all children are the same. Some will do well academically and others will do well in other things, but they're not all the same. So I will maybe, you can show the last slide, two slides, but I will, as I asked and you would come on board. That picture, that photograph is taken from one of those joyful schools. It's a school which is very ordinary school. And all the children, you know, among those children are children with special needs. And yet they're included and they're so happy there because they don't fear. So there are other things, the values that are nurtured in these schools, which I don't have time, but we'll share the presentation for anybody who's interested or we can go to the website. Okay, thank you, thank you. So we thank, thank you so lab. much, Prof. Give, give me this. So we let Andiwo to finalize I think, uh, the, session, I'll try, the recommendations. I'll try very quickly. It will be unfair to say all that. Thanks to Boas and uh, uh, Daktari for setting the pace. Uh, what I want to do is just uh, share with you some of the conclusions we are seeing or making, and then what do we think we need to do from this uh, convening. Uh, I think I'll start with the conclusions, around four or five. Uh, one is critical consumer of values are missing from the CBC curriculum design. And I think one of the actions that I hope we can uh, document uh, for immediate attention is to take uh, advantage of the ongoing reforms and make sure that uh, we expand the values within the CBC curriculum design. Because, because I think if we, we can engage with the working group or we can engage with the KICD directly, that is, I think, a very good opportunity. Yeah, in a country as diverse as Kenya, unity cannot be attained if we don't respect the diversity and uh, the, in the inequalities, if we don't appreciate the inequalities. And I think we are saying that because those two critical values are actually missing, among others, in the current uh, uh, design. And then uh, the other conclusion that we are making is that there's no doubt that uh, universally acceptable uh, uh, positive values should be at the core of the value-based education curriculum. Our system should be guided by these values and produce learners who are morally upright and able to differentiate between what is right and what is wrong. And we believe that uh, even though maybe the, the window might have uh, ended of uh, public hearings by the working group, but we can still, as a special interest group, we can still reach out and tell them we want to talk to them on this, or just reach out to KICD direct on this particular one. A value-based education must embrace uh, content and pedagogy uh, that enables learners to think critically, supported by an environment that is con uh, conducive and friendly. I think uh, I'll stop the, the conclusions there, because some of them are actually uh, coming back from what my two colleagues have presented. We are making three recommendations. Uh, in addition to now engaging uh, KICD and uh, the, the working group on uh, the, the point on ad additional values. One is that appreciating that teachers uh, are, are at the core of any education system, it is therefore critical that teachers are targeted for transformative action. And we want uh, Uraya and uh, uh, the, uh, the partners here to design a program that we are going to work 
together with TSC and KICD in the next four or five years for this to succeed so that you are targeting teachers. If you want to target teachers, there are two institutions in this county you can't ignore, TSC and KICD. What can we design and uh, uh, work with them on preserving uh, preservice training of teachers? How can we influence the preservice training, the, the, the college-based training for teachers? And then there's something that they're now calling continuous professional development of teachers. How can we also influence that? And I think if we do that, we are going to be able to uh, uh, make a lot of difference. That is uh, number one. Number two, for civil society groups in the room and maybe others outside, civic education for schools that is value-based. Can we be able to design a program that is going also to give informal education to teachers? Can be able to target boards of management of those schools? Can be able to, uh, to uh, give orientation to parents' associations? Like I think uh, Boaz was saying, teachers are missing. We are not even hearing the voices of parents now in, this re in the reform debate. While the same parents will be complaining tomorrow uh, that CBC is burdensome, but now they are not talking. So how can we be able to engage parents to the associations through the boards of management meetings and all that? And uh, we have, I think, uh, done certain things before as civil society, like school clubs. How do we uh, supporting other co-curricular activities to be able to instill values through those programs? So I think that is our recommendation number two. Number three, uh, we are suggesting that you target universities and tertiary institutions. We are calling them uh, institutions that are, the, the, are at the end of the education pipeline. These are the institutions that are preparing teachers. They are the workplace for many of us Kenyans. They train teachers and channel out there. If we don't target the university culture and curriculum, we will not achieve much and then the colleges. I think we are also proposing that you organize a program that is targeting all the universities and tertiary colleges, not only faculties of education, but all university departments, if we want this to be a Kenyan culture that we can live. I think because of time, I'm not going to pass uh, to go beyond that, but we are making those three recommendations. A program that we work with TSC and KICD, for to transform education and, and starting with teachers, a program that CSO can do directly with uh, schools, uh, parents, BOMs, and other structures, and then a program that targets universities and tertiary colleges. And I think uh, given that uh, we are coming into this at this stage of design, we will be ready uh, as uh, professionals in the sector to work, work with Uraya and work with other partners on this to make sure that if we decide to pursue the three proposals, we, we are able to uh, pursue them together up to the end. Thank you very much for the audience. Okay, let's clap for Andiwo. Thank you very much. I'd like to beg for your indulgence so that we can listen to the next uh, presenters just before we, we have a combined plenary. So let me bring on board Father Mwaniki to give us um, on the session of uh, the role of faith-based organizations in inculcating values in their society. Father Moniki. Thank you. Good evening. So I'm going to give a presentation on uh, faith-based organization, uh, basing my argument on Caritas Nyahururu, which is a charitable organization registered under trustee of Catholic Diocese of Nyahururu, uh, mandated to implement and conduct development programs within Laikipia, Nyandarwa, and parts of Baringo counties. A caritas is a Latin word that means love and compassion. It also means being charitable to all people who are within us. As Caritas in Nyahururu, being a non-profit organization association, uh, we are inspired uh, by the religion and religious beliefs that God is love and we need to extend that love through faith to our brothers and sisters. Any organization engaged in development work whose mission and vision 
is inspired and guided by the teachings of the church. What is a value? For us to be able to work effectively, we must know what is a value. A value at times can be relative, depending on how one sees it or depict or think about it. A value, individual values are the motive people. Uh, individual beliefs, are, values are individual beliefs that motivate people to act in one way or another. They serve as a guide for human behavior. Generally, people are predisposed to adopt very values that are raised with them. People are also, also tend to believe that those values are right because they are all they are the values of their particular culture. A value also is something which is good, desirable, or worthwhile. There is a worldview of a value. Some think a value is being wealthy, or power, pressure, or maybe uh, fame. Even some think of vanity, as well as revenge. The biblical teachings of a value. A value is oft, often the or, or always the opposite of the worldly values of, of a worldly view of a value. That is kindness respect for all people instead of power, humility instead of status, honesty and generosity instead of wealth, self-control instead of self-indulgency, forgiveness instead of revenge. The Christian values promote peace and goodwill among people in accordance with the purpose of God who never achieve perfection in perfection in this life, but those people who strive to obey God often find sense of joy and peace that no worldly rewards can watch, can give. The role of the FBOs in inculcating values in the society, we focus on the issues of morality more, more, more than the secular organization. The FBOs are ability to ground their work in religion, uh, also, can, uh, also they enhance and influence community as they are able to, uh, to enable them to call on people's moral duty. There is that another great role of which the FBOs they usually do, uh, 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 checking and, and provision of reliable information on matters of development affecting communities, accountability, on aid donation provided to the communities. Adherence of values guided by FBOs, reading, ex reading by example in adoption of interdenominational coexistence, fearlessly holding light holders accountable for their actions in the, in the office, acting as a gatekeeper, watchman, against exploitation of the community. We have also challenges at the FBOs uh, while implementing or maybe inculcating values in society. One is the spreading extremism of interpretation of religion, which do affect and uh, become a hindrance or a challenge uh, to most of the F FBOs. Instigating societal divisions on religions between Catholics and Protestants and other religions, at times encouraging voluntary conversion to the religion uh, through aids and donation, uh, as Constitution says that uh, in uh, Article 23, some Article 4 emphasizes that uh, every person shall not be compelled to act or engage in an act that is contrary, that is contrary to the person's belief or religion. In conclusion, because of interest of time, uh, Pope Benedict the 16, in his encyclical Caritas Veritate, Veritate, Love in Truth, addressing the issue of human integral development, underlined that charity is received and given. Utu values should be, uh, should be received and given correctively as well as individually from every institution. Love, which is a command, 
value should be revealed and made present in us as we share the common origin, the common earth, and the co co uh, common destiny. Love your neighbor as yourself. Share the, the, there is no other commandment greater than this. That is Mark, Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 12, verse 1. We are all invited to share our faith as well as our beliefs in the Utu Gospel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your insights. I now want to call upon Chef Hussein Hassan Olenado to make his remarks. Good, good. Is it now evening or afternoon? Good evening. Bismillahir <laughs> uh, <coughs> Rahman Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. May I take this opportunity also to say something about this wonderful event that has been going on for the last two days. I'm sorry that I was not there, I was not able to make it, but um, you will allow me if I a little bit uh, get lost in my presentation because I know you have been engaged in a very rich conversation with different uh, personalities and experts in the field. Uh, first, when I heard the lady was singing with a very nice voice and saying, freedom of the ma, then I was asking, is, which ma, is it mind or ma? I thought she meant where I come from. I come from ma, ma land. <laughs> so I was getting confused. I said, oh, we, somebody's trying to free us here, which is good. Uh, when I hear about this concept of Utu, which is basically coming from the word Ubuntu. And sometimes I also think that is where Mutu comes from. <laughs> I, I tend to think that um, one of the very, very uh, eloquent conversation I've ever had about this subject is one by uh, Ruben Kigame. When he was interviewed uh, during the campaign period, and he gave the picture of what you would like this country to be and how we'll approach this politics and governance if it manages to be what you wanted. And to me, I don't think I've ever had someone who put it as clearly and as eloquently as that gentleman during that period. It is very, very attractive concept. I wish Kenyans can actually learn to adapt. And I want to believe the journey that this conversation has begun may basically seek to find a direction because where we are as a country, we are more or less in a roundabout of our next destination. We are going round and around about. We are yet to identify which particular route are we going to take as a nation. Because we have come in if you look at the, all the political processes or the regimes that has passed through this country, you realize in every election we have always an issue, but that issue cannot be resolved. And we thought maybe county governments, by having the devolution, we are going to address some of our problems, but what we have done, we have actually devolved our problems. So we have not sorted our problems. Maybe this particular concept may make a positive contribution towards healing what has actually been healing this great country of ours. Just to give a little bit of Islamic perspective on, on the subject, uh, on the Utu, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God talks about humanity in the Holy Quran 306 times, where God mentions or where he directs humanity by saying, Ya you al nas, O mankind. 306 times God speaks to humanity. God calls us, all of us, Bani Adam, yani children of Adam. In the Holy Quran, you will actually realize that it's not that, we don't, it's not that God did not know that he can only talk to Muslims on our, on our view, but he, re he talked to all of us irrespective of the communities, the faiths, and any social cultural backgrounds that we come from, and he, he addresses us collectively in the Holy Quran. And that shows the importance of humanity 
or being human. In the Quran, Allah says, O mankind, we created you from a single pair of male and female and made you into nations and tribes that you may know one another. The only reason why we are different, why we are white, black, yellow, and whatever color that we are, we are Maasai, Kalenji, Luo, Luya, and whatever you can, you can name, it is only because so that we can actually be able to identify one another. There is absolutely no reason why we are different. But he puts the caption, Allah says, the best among you all is the one who has faith, the one who fears God. And why I thought it is important to remind ourselves of such teaching of the Holy Quran is just to note that we need one another as we live in this world. Because our creation, we come from the same source of, of, uh, of humanity. We did, nobody else came from any other person. It doesn't matter who you come, where you come from. We always talk about uh, Nabi Adam or our father Adam and our. It is important again to remember in Islam, the only prophet, Muhammad, peace be upon him, put a lot of emphasis on the neighbor. And one time, the close companions of the prophet were so afraid that there is a likelihood that the prophet may actually declare that the neighbors have a right to inherit the person. It was the fear because all the time there was a conversation about how important it is to take care of your neighbor. And the neighborhood according to Islam is actually 40 houses on this side, 40 houses on the other side. So you are not talking about that your immediate neighbor. And in this neighborhood, we are not talking about the faith. We are not talking about the tribe. We are not talking about anything else. We are just talking about the neighbor. So that neighborhood is a command that God has actually uh, commanded us to remember and to live with our neighbors and to love to them what we love for ourselves. And God says, by no means shall you attain righteousness until you give freely that of which you love. To give to who? to anyone. It has not been said to this particular group or to this particular person that you need to give uh, what, you, what you really love for yourself. The preservation of a social order depends on each and every member of the society. Freely adhering to the same moral principles and practices. Islam, founded on individual and collective morality and responsibility, introduced a social revolution in the context, in, uh, in the Quran and in such terms as equality, Justice, fairness, brotherhood, mercy, compassion, solidarity, and freedom of choice. That is Utu in our understanding. Leaders are responsible for the application of these principles and are accountable to God and man for their determination. It is reported that a man went to uh, the second caliph of Islam, Sayyidina Omar, to talk to him. It was the night time. A candle burned on Omar's desk. Umar asked the man if he wanted to discuss, if what he wanted to discuss was personal. The man said to him it was actually uh, personal. What did, uh, what did the Caliph Omar did? He put off the candle. When he put off the candle in his office in the night, he explained to the person and told him, I am putting off this candle because this, uh, this has been bought from the state resources. Now that you are discussing a personal issue, then I have to put off because that is actually we are going to be abusing the state resources. That is the essence of accountability and how faith can actually help the leadership to be accountable to the people they lead. There is a relationship in Islam between individual responsibility and the rights and privilege derived from the membership in the community. Individual obligations must be met before we can claim a portion from the community of which he is, he, we are part of it. The notion of brotherhood and solidarity not only impose upon community duty to care for its members, but also require each person to use his initiative to carry out individual and social responsibilities according to his ability. Lastly, the prophet advised us, 
Whatever you see, whatever of you who sees an evil action, let him change it with his hand. And if you are not able to do so, then with his tongue. And if he is not able to do so, then with his heart. You just hate it. And But it says that is the weakest of the faith. We have been given three options. One is to stop what we don't like using our own hands. In Kenya, for example, we use our own hands to put the leadership in place. Because we vote for the leaders. So we have to stop things that are not right using our own hands. If we cannot use our own hands out of fear, then we are supposed to advise and tell that what he's doing is right. But if again we fear even to speak out, then we hate it with our hearts. We just hate. We don't like this thing. But uh, again, it is said that is the weakest of faith. Because if you cannot stop it with your hand, you can't even speak out. Uh, the only option you have is to hate. Uh, it is the weakest of the faith, but it is better than just being comfortable with the status when things are not going uh, right. I want find once again to congratulate the organizers of this important forum for allowing us to share the few ideas that you ha we have, but we hope that this conversation will continue for the benefit of all of us and for our country. May God bless all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. And now, finally, let me call upon Canon Adolwa. I know when you are the last speaker, you may be at the, you know, every Lakama Vile Mesemo Apambele, like it has been said before, but I know, <laughs> I know you are very engaging. So let's have Canon Adolwa, then we have a plenary. Good afternoon. <coughs> I hope you're not asleep. Uh, maybe uh, just stretch your hand, uh, just stretch a little bit. I'm sure you could stand. Just for, it's just up a minute for those who must. Uh, so that uh, you, uh, thank you very much. You can take your seats. Um, <laughs> that I said ha half a minute. Okay, I can see people are enjoying. Uh, great, great, great. Thank you. <coughs> As you've heard that uh, I'm actually uh, a minister of a local uh, congregation. So I'll give you uh, the perspective of what I find in a local congregation. When Oliver asked me to make comments, I remembered yesterday that d uh, Dr. Linda, when she spoke, and she spoke about CSOs, the questions that went in her direction were about the church, and I thought, do I want to wade into that direction? One of the questions that, you've, that really was hot here is, the, does religion really work? Um, and, and it was very, I mean, it was very, very engaging because we are asking uh, the, the, what is the role of the faith uh, in, in, in this conversation around Utu. And I think my other colleagues have uh, come out very, very uh, well. Let me answer it by saying in very simple terms, and I think somebody alluded to it, as a local minister, what, what, what uh, captures me in terms of believing that it works is that every Sunday I don't call my congregants to come. They come. So something must be working for them uh, to wake up every Sunday morning to come without me making a phone call towards them to come. And then somebody also alluded it the secondly. Secondly, they actually put money together to come and actually put in the basket without me coercing them. So something must be working. I think it's important that we that, that I, began, I begin there. Because when the question was asked, I know that Dr. Mshai was hoping that I make a comment. I know I could hear my name being called from the back, that, Canon, why don't you make a comment? But I wasn't ready to wade into that conversation. But then when I reflected at night, I thought, but they'll come on Sunday. I know this Sunday I'm already getting ready to preach, but I'm not going to make any phone calls. So something must be working. The question then, uh, that then we who are in the leadership need to uh, then contend with is to ask ourselves, uh, which is a question that we always do ask ourselves, because when we say Kenya is how many percent Christians? What do we normally use? What is the percentage we use? So we use 80. So we also, as clergy, when we sit in our reflection meetings, because we do, we wrestle a lot with that same question. Does what we teach them on Sunday really work? So they're coming, <laughs> uh, but 
what is happening out there, does it really reflect what we are actually teaching them every Sunday? This Sunday I'm going to be teaching about hope in, a, in an environment of despair. And I'm hoping that by the time I finish my 30-minute homily, I'll have people with some nuggets that they can work with during the week because that's really the goal of every week, why I wake up, why I spend a lot of time to research, think through, and then work out to communicate. So I say, yes, faith-based organizations, I think, have actually a very big part. I don't know if it occurs to us that it is actually when people go to the mosque every Friday and Sunday that actually the majority of the people after school, that's the only other opportunity, apart from the workshops you come, that people naturally take themselves to a place where they can receive learning. Apart from school. That's the only, it's a, at the mosque, at the temple, or at the church, where people are actually, they take a notebook and come and learn. The question that we have to ask ourselves is what is it that we are imparting on those mornings or afternoons or at Bible studies that should be of value, that should transform the country. Because that's really what I look at as a faith practitioner, that I have an opportunity, but even I still wrestle with when the values are not, because I have teachers in my, in my, in my congregation. I have some of you here who are very, very, s I, I, in fact, I end up here because I have some activists in my congregation. And they realize that, well, I am very comfortable with activists because I'm saying, what you're doing is what really you're trying to say, that's what you should do. Secondly, when I preach, and I think I said it at the meeting we had at the last Urahia meeting, I said, for a preacher, it's actually not my work to be contending with government. I should contend with government as a last resort. Really, the prophetic preaching that I should do when I'm challenging government should be, thus says the Lord, because it has come to the end. But the day-to-day -day thing that I do is I should be teaching faith. And, and Dr. Linda said something yesterday in her response about does religion work. She said the challenge, of course, historically is how we've taught faith, is people are taught faith in terms of their personal implication, but translating it to the public implication has always been a challenge. And so that's a big one that we must do. Now, as I finish, I would like to talk about, and, uh, and I've alluded to it, what is it, what is the summary of all that Jesus taught? is I'm sure, and uh, for if you're a Catholic or if you're an Anglican, that is one of the things that you'd recite every Sunday. It is the summary of the, the summary of the, I want to see whether there are good Anglicans or Catholics here. And he further alluded to it, the summary of the law, which is, love, love the Lord your God with, with all, all your heart, heart with, with all your mind, mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, love, love your, your neighbor, neighbor as yourself. yourself. That is the summary of the law. Do I need to say any more about Utu? No. That is it. Yeah. It's captured right there. That if you forget everything else, this is what we are saying, live by. This is the, this is the silver bullet of how you must practice your religion. And I beg to stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. The hands are already going up. I think these people are fired up. We are having two sessions, one on education and uh, one on uh, the role of uh, faith-based organizations. So you will, s I mean, as you ask questions, they will either be directed to the education or the faith-based. And uh, there's my neighbor here. So I, had f I have two neighbors, just like uh, all, uh, sh the sheikh has said, you start with your neighbors. So I have three neighbors here who will start, and then I go to the other side. I have seen Sheila. Aya. Wangwa natuko? Eh, tumesawi language sana. Sala, lazima pia tuchangamke. Padi na fikira meenda. Lakini, boa siko pale. Sa, swali yangu ni raisi, uraia. Na fikiri, tuko kwa hii country na tumezalo kwa hii country na tumishi kwa hii country. Na vugu vugu tulianza 90s tukikuja mpaka sasa hizi bado tuko anafikiri tena ni kama vugu vugu inaanza na ni muhimu sana kuna stage mbili ama kuna vikundi viwili hapa 
tunawakosa ama wanakosekana ama hao ndio wanafanya country inaenda vibaya ya kwanza na msiniombe vibaya <laughs> ni churches makanisa maze Kenya tu kuna makanisa mingi sana za promotion sikuizi ploti moja unapata kanisa saba na zote ziko na speakers alafu hizi kanisa zishageuka kama vijana siku za election ni siku zao za kuvuna tuko na rambe mwesh siji tuko na siji funeral mwesh tuko na wedding mwesh saa ngapi atenda kuchallenge yule jamaa kama ameingia kwa power hiyo ni problem tuko nayo na wako ready kuingia kumbuka lenzi nafikiri ule kiongozi ile timu tulikuwa nao ya mwisho boss unaweza nikumbusha tuliofunga mano bado tukiendeleaaga hata IPPG ikikuja tukiwa safari park tukienda Limuru ni ile enzi tukiwa na ndugu yetu Mutava Musembi hapo nilikuwa champion makanisa tuko na makanisa lakini tuna viongozi wa makanisa eh narudi hapa tena kwa mpole dadi mama tuko tu na wewe hapa usikimbie tuko tu hapa sawa ingine ni na, nasema tu mtaijaji na hapo mbele ingine ni sijaona hiyo team hapa nimeona makanisa hapa linafanya na naongelea na dabu sijaona team ya my unions believe yangu kiuliza mzee wangu hapa ambapo ametembea mimi nikienda mbali nimeenda busia country imekuwa kikuaga inakontroliwa na unions na makanisa hizo ma trade unions hapa sijaziona na next time uraia tukifanya at least tuweza kuwakumbuka mpaka saa hizi sijaelewa wala sina habari Kenya hii tuko na unions ngapi kama tunaweza shikao watu na tuwarudishe katika hizi round table zetu bila shaka tunasema tunabomoa ile gate tutaibomoa kumbuka pale tumetoka asante sana hizo ndio bonga point zangu um, thank you my name is Irina Sua um, for the education we have to bring back the union so that the dignity of teachers are restored as a child of teachers i feel like teachers have become service slaves more than civil servants universities also have to become sites for ideological discourse because now they have been overtaken by corporate and we do not have academic freedom as a principle of democracy that we claim to have lastly we have to humanize our schools at the moment our boarding schools are concentration camps and the summary of the law felt nostalgic as a former anglican but the churches really need to activate back to the role they played before we got the constitution Thank you very much, uh, Sheila. Sheila, and then we come back to Masese and your, and your colleague. Sheila, let's let the mic go to Sheila. Thank you very much, Helen, and the, the very strong panel. Very grateful for that discussion. I think I just want to quick, quick shot to Kanona Dolwa. You said something is working. They come every Sunday. But they come every Sunday after the, they've seen all week, on, on the whole week, but they still, they'll still come on Sunday. And sometimes they even sing on the pulpit. They come, you give them the pulpit, they sing, they lie to us as Kenyans, they abuse our values, but you still allow them to come. So I think the church also has to have that discussion. Why do, I, why do you allow these people to continue using the pulpit? And we are seeing that more. In fact, right now, when you speak to a lot of Kenyans, they have lost hope because they say there's a lot of religion without spirituality, you know? And I think the church really needs to have a hard uh, discussion among itself on what it has done to promote and, and to bring us to where we are now, you know? Because you allow these politicians, I don't know if that's because of the money or because they're in power and they're in authority, and, and, and we, we allow them to continue abusing us even in church. My, 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 my practical suggestion, I think I'm a Catholic, and um, I, I, I think that there are various opportunities, not just the Catholic church, but all churches, because we have the Jumuiyas, the small Christian communities. How can we use this to bring, go back to the basics and, and start you know, talking to parents? Because all of us who are members of Jumuiyas and all these other, they, you know, the core group, the cell groups, when you go to the Protestant churches, and even the mosques, I, Muslims, I know they have groups among which they're able to talk to their communities, outside the, cha the church, you know, how, what can we do there? The youth groups, what can we do? Just relating that to the conversation that Dr. Sheila and Andio had on how to engage uh, the, the children. 
and the youth. What can we do practically? Because for me, having spent the last three years talking about leadership and integrity, do which law, which legislation, to be honest, I've given, back out, I've given up on parliamentarians, I've given up on my generation and the older generation above me. I'm now thinking of the young people. If you're going to see a change in how Kenyans vote in 2032, we need to now work backwards. 2032, how old are they now? They are, they're going to be eight, if they're going to be 18 in 2030, in 20, is it 2032, they're now eight years, seven years. Maybe in class one, you know, or PP, you know, the guys in kindergarten. What can we do as, as an education sector starting with that group so that we can now start to see a change and, you know, start promoting that culture of Utu. I think that's where we need to go. It will take a number of years. It will not be immediate, but we now need to start, you know, just working backwards. Church and the education sector as well. I think one last recommendation, practically, with the working party, we have one of our own, Professor Collins Odoti, I know he's a member of Uraia. Can we reach out to him, given some of these recommendations coming out, even if the window for you know, contributions is closed, let's work with him, let's give him our proposals to see what can be done as the, we look at the CBC uh, curriculum. Thank you. Okay. Um, you said Shira then Masese. And I have the microphone. <laughs> uh, thank you. It appears like when one stands, eh, it's not easily forgotten. Yeah, I, let me make a recommendation based on what Shira said. I assume then that by the end of this conference tomorrow, we'll have like, resolutions eh, uh, that uh, we can uh, use uh, the advantage that we have and submit to the task force. Eh? Uh, Paws, uh, you talked about education, the form of education. I'm a teacher. I don't know if you are one, yeah? I was supposed to be teaching. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Tari, because you reminded me of uh, uh, the classroom. But there's the education that happens outside the school. And uh, it's Joshua in the morning who mentioned about uh, poor parenting. Huh? We are all parents. So we are the poor parents. And uh, my own reflection was, growing up, we had the Sunday schools. They already happen. Uh, they still happen. I'm Catholic. We used to have uh, grandparents telling us stories. And those stories were value-laden. Uh, as an adolescent, I knew myself because of the stories. And I was supposed to ensure that the girls my age grew to be women because there was always a warning in the stories of what would happen if I communed inappropriately uh, with the girls my age. Is it possible then that in our conceptualization of our approaches, we might want to go back uh, to that oral tradition where we can reteach that's going to reteach ourselves parenting. Uh, the story of churches that started yesterday, I know I confessed to my priest, but I think canon will come to church. Sometimes we come to church not because of you, but because of the seed that has been planted in us, knowing that there is a sovereignty that is defined. In fact, to be honest, the current crop of clergy does not inspire people my age. It's only uh, growing up, we only have one priest left, Father Gabriel Doran, who we always feel like, yes, this is the person whose footsteps we should walk on. So my challenge to you, you will influence us through your example, but not through your word. <laughs> so if it's possible now, the reflection you should have, because you said you have reflections. I used to, to talk to the Catholic Conference, uh, the Kenya Conference of Catholic Bishops sometimes. And one day I told them, I think, my graces, you probably are going to lose it sometime very soon. 
And I think perhaps you should ask yourselves, are we effective stewards? Are we effective shepherds of God's people? Thank you very much. Mine goes to the church and ed the education. I'm Grace from Laikipia. And when I talk of Laikipia, uh, maybe what comes to your mind is where Utu really needs to be practiced. I've seen people coming with a kettle and just grace into your farm and there's no Utu. Now, I believe um, education in the church will have to help us sort out some of these things. We've been told violence brings violence church and um, people will go there and get uh, something from the church. So kindly help us understand Utu from the perspective of places where uh, people don't care about what belongs to the other party. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We have her mm -hmm. and then we go back for they have to give their closing statement. It's okay. My sister has, has done. done. Okay. Thank you. So there was Fred here. Let Fred finalize. And a lady here, Second. who is burning. Ah, yeah. Half a minute. One minute. So, yeah, yeah, oh, I forgot. Yes, I worry. Yeah, our elder will finalize. Yeah. I'm told Fred, that. Fred. Yeah. Very brief. 30 seconds. Thank you. I think the role of, yeah. of the FBO in promoting Utu is found in Genesis 126 when God created man. He gave him all responsibility to take care of of in other creatures, so I won't explain my point mo in detail, because I may end up maybe <laughs> not preaching, but what I'm trying to say, the church we only lost when we started commercializing everything. You remember the role, as Christian we follow Jesus, and Jesus practiced Utu. When he saw that people were angry, he fed them. When he saw that people were sick, he healed them. So my advice to the church or faith-based faith organization, let us go back to the foundation of Christianity. Thank you, Thank Fred. You. And Fred, fortunately, you are also one of them. So you are actually <laughs> reflecting by yourself. So let's have uh, our elder, Awori. He's been having his hand up. Yeah, uh, I think I'll just... I'll just follow up on Fred and quickly um, on the role of the church. I've just been reading some uh, social media uh, news news outlets, and there's some a place where you see uh, it's boasting of the seven richest pastors, pastor billionaire pastors in Kenya, yeah, owners of churches, and uh, it's, it's it's written a language that glorifies their wealth. It's not talking about the wealth or the welfare of their, fol their congregants. Now, I want to pick up from there quickly and ask the church to reflect on this point. Look at the Asian communities, spiritual communities, the Bora community, the Jaffries, the Hindu, and the, the, the who owned the Aga Khan University, the Aga Khan uh, Hostel, the, the Ismailia. Now, there's one thing you notice. You won't see rich, wealthy, billionaire priests. You'll see a wealthy community. Educated, taken care of, housed. You and they have one rule among the Islamia. No Islamia or Jaffrey should lack health care. No Islamia or a Jaffri should lack education. No Bora should be on the streets begging. And that's why you don't find a single Mohindi on the streets begging. What is wrong with the other side? Maybe we should all join the Boras. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is the church has to rediscover the Utu spirit. I know there are so many questions, but uh, please, just in the interest of time, let them give their closing remarks. I hope tomorrow we could even start early so that we have the first hour where we reflect on some of the questions which are coming up. But I think the church...
canon. I think we need a forum for the church alone. So let's start with the Boaz and then come, come down. How much time you should tell me? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this Kenya is our country and we are the sovereign citizens of this land. And you know that your voice and your actions can make this Kenya better. So I would start with uh, Sheila and tell you, please, we are sorry you are giving up on us, but please don't give up on yourself. Uh, I think that's just sufficient. And I would also appeal to each and every one of you, Sheila is here, I'm using her name, not to give up on you, yourselves. And um, the battle that we are faced with, it is continuous. Uh, there are times when you make several strides forward. There are times you realize that you're backpedaling. But for you, whatever it, it takes, remain uh, facing forward. Uh, the issues of religion and all that, how they impact on the society because it has got a bearing on education. I think uh, we need to get that session uh, you have talked about, uh, Madam Moderator. But uh, also, it just adds flavor and value when our institutions of religion realize that uh, the people look upon them with a lot of hope and expectations. You're someone, if you tell me where you'll be, I may appear there. Um, I'm SDA by the by, uh, profession, uh, I mean, professing the faith, and I know that even at times, I have to call my pastor aside and tell pastor, uh, you know, when you mention this and that, many of the people could get you wrong. But I'm just telling you because for me, I feel that the way I've come here, God is speaking to me, and thank God that I can speak to him also directly. So others may go astray. So just when you get chance, try to help it in this manner. I normally give a feedback. Whether they like it or they don't, it's okay. That, that, that's also a situation that is also up to them. And, and um, uh, Masese, my, my younger brother, it's, it's, it's okay to rethink of our, the cultural norm, the practices and all that. But you'll also realize that uh, we've grown up in very difficult situations. You try going back there, you'll not even find them. I know uh, the last time if I was to travel with you, probably I'll go there and then I'll start hearing you are being called the elder. Am I right? Because many of them have gone. And even those who are there have been left with a lot of work. They are the ones shouldering the responsibility of children. So there's a lot more of uh, work that they are good doing that they are hunting day and night just to place something on the table. I, I would appeal that we have a mechanism through which that can be recreated, but also positive ones. Positive ones, I'm saying because there are pockets of the Kenyan nation where indoctrination of very bad ideologies start from childhood. Our ni wachawi, our ni namnahi, our don't think of them as even being leaders or being anything. It starts from that so socialization. So I'm saying the positive aspect of uh, orientation. And uh, I, I would also go to the, then when I was talking of creating a foundation of education that then makes the society feel, we want to transform ourselves. It's emancipatory. It is supposed to help liberate us. It's supposed to enable us to realize that the way I'm born today, even if I'm go to go back today, the world continues, isn't it? But that it is, I'm happier and I become better by seeing and helping where I can or not interfering with the betterment of another, particularly when that betterment is done in good, uh, good faith and in good order. So um, I I'll just restate what one of these musicians, uh, Lucky Dube, is the one who was uh, who asked in his songs, what makes you feel happy when you see another man suffering? Or when you see another man starving, you know? This, these are things which we need to learn because they are the, at the core of the Utu. So let us re-socialize or uh, uh, revisit the philosophy that is going to be fed into our education system. And 
let us remember the way uh, J.M. Kariuki said that even with the kind of the national anthem that you have, however melodious, if it doesn't come from the heart, then it is useless. Even if you have the best of the flags, that when you swing it around, then people say, that is wonderful. If it doesn't come from you as a person from the heart, that it means you're protecting humanity, then it is useless. Because if you are to use it to silence another person or to kill, then you are going astray of Utu. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy about the discussion, the way it is gone. Uh, let us look at how else we can, we, we can uh, uh, discuss all these matters. There was an aspect, an aspect of ideological uh, 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 training or induction and discourse about the teachers, particularly at the higher education level. My friends, if you've interacted with our teachers, and teachers are teachers from the kindergarten to the university, and even outside of that. But if you interact with those people, you'll find that the current system is a way in which every day people are thinking of survival. They're thinking of survival. So how do we ensure that first let us recognize and bring back that uh, respect among our teachers? How do we support them and motivate them in a way that they themselves will also go out of the way to do uh, good work? I think that is very important for us. So for me, uh, let us reorient our education system to value humanity, because humanity for me comes first. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's always difficult coming after uh, people like Boaz and all the other speakers here. Um, so I will just focus my, my comments, not on any specific speaker, though there's one speaker, I don't know whether Sheila, who had talked about my namesake, who had talked about the young people and um, maybe one of the things, this is just very specific to that, and then I'll go into the general. Uh, one of the things we are doing is having what you call learning circles with young people that's managed by young people so they can discuss issues that are of relevance to them, but having at the background the wisdom of age if they do need our help. So that's something that uh, we're finding to be very useful. But apart from that, let me just go back to our topic, the issue of um, Utu and education and value-based education. And I will repeat what I said earlier, that uh, which we all know. Education is about learners and it's about teachers. But how can teachers teach something that they do not know? Yet, it is extremely important because the future of education, the uh, future of education is value-based education. It is the education that promotes, that puts at the center the concept of Utu. And why are the teachers the most important? I do recognize the importance of parents. But look, let's look at it this way. Um, here we have a teacher. The teachers, there's a big gap between school and the community. And the teachers are complaining that this parent is not coming to school. A good parent is um, recognized as somebody uh, who always comes in the cold. But can you imagine a parent, a mother, maybe it's a single mother, or there's an absentee father in that family, coming to school, and yet there's no food on the table? How is that parent? supposed to come every time the school calls, right? So that is something we have to think about. And I believe teachers can be the great equalizers. Because yes, it's important for parents to play their role, but they must also have that. Uh, they might be committed, but they don't have that opportunity to come. So teachers as the great equalizers. And I've seen 
a lot of teachers who go out of their way, even in the worst of circumstances, because they believe in what they're doing. So maybe the question is, how do we bring back that, that belief? And it does not have to do with how much money you have. Honestly, we've seen our leaders with loads of money. What are they doing? The same thing with teachers. Uh, many teachers who have made a difference in the lives of the children may be working under very difficult circumstances. And I've seen them, and I salute them. The other thing is, for the teachers, the three, three ways they are uh, the future of this country, the future of value-based education. They, they are also the teachers who can bring joy to the children. And the joy is joy to the boy and the girl and the intersex child. I've not heard anybody talk about the intersex who don't even have an identity because, yes, the laws have changed, but who's practicing that law? Where are the facilities for these intersex children? So the joy to all the children and if you can do it, sometimes they may use the cane, but very little. You know, children will tell us, let them stop beating us like donkeys. Let them beat us like human beings. You know, that's a very critical issue. So teachers who protect children and bring joy, and it will make life much easier for them even to have a school. A value-based school will really help even teachers to have discipline. And finally, uh, is the final, the final way that teachers who can, uh, oh, I think I've already mentioned it, the positive deviant teachers. Let us also look at the positive. Yes, I think Boaz was talking about the positives. Let us also look about the positives. Even as much as we highlight all the abuses that are going on, sometimes teachers don't know what else to do. So let's use the example of the positives who are there to demonstrate to other teachers it can be done. You don't have to do things this way. You don't have to be stressed out. A child who's asking questions is not a bad child. Just a curious child. Let there be the noise. You know, there's a good noise and a bad noise. Let us have the good noise from the children. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, uh, members for the comments. I think uh, most of the issues raised to, uh, have been addressed. I only have two. One, uh, thanks. I think there's a lady who spoke here very well about the three areas, which actually went back to what we recommended. How do we transform teachers? Recommendation number one. How do we transform schools? Recommendation number two. How do we transform universities and tertiary colleges? Thank you for that. And I think to Masese, we mentioned four platforms. The classroom, the school, the family, the community. How do we work with those platforms to transform this area? Then lastly, for a year and this conference, I believe that uh, as, a, as at the end of this, you are going to develop what I would call in my male language, a theory of change a theory of change that is founded on the Utu philosophy with pathways. From this discussion alone, I'm seeing four pathways. First pathway to that change is the FBOs. The second pathway to that change is the unions and the corporates from CAPTCHA and others. The third pathway to that change is our education system, the education sector. And the other pathway that I've seen is you out of school youth, or what youth programming do we want to do to achieve this? Other pathways could be there, but already from this session, I think my parting shot is that your theory of change should be able to consider those four pathways. Thank you. Thank you. I wish to respond uh, uh, to one of us who asked, we have so many churches. We should remember the <laughs> SBT said that uh, Africans are, relig are notorious religious, so we must respect that, uh, not a victim 
but uh, dearly we know that uh, we have that spirit in us. Another point I wish to respond to on the issue of uh, uh, shepherds in the church, especially uh, with their voices as a church. Uh, at the beginning of these sessions, this convening, we were told by Oliver, uh, executive director, that uh, all of us we should be uh, di disturbed in our hearts and in our minds. This is our calling. This is our calling for us, not only the clergy, but also you, everybody, that we are called to be voice of the voiceless, not only by giving voices, but also, uh, also as well as also uh, giving a very good testimony on how maybe uh, to deliberate and to live with the people within whom we are living with. The last point is that uh, somebody asked about Raikipia and those areas wh what the FBOs are doing, working with Uraya, we usually convince, uh, we usually have meetings on especially when we have issues in our communities as to bring them together and we discuss the issues that are affecting, affecting the communities uh, in, in order to upheld the coexistence and the love in the community. So all of us, we are called and uh, uh, this is according for us all, for this Utu. We remember that uh, on Sunday, people still will come on church, will come in church, as well as uh, they also wish to be sanctified. I was sharing with some, somebody yesterday, and I said that uh, we should remember the doors of the church are always open. So we come every time, every moment, to be sanctified. Not because we are holy. Even as Kraji, we cannot say that truly we are perfect. We are also in a, a journey toward that Utu. Also, some of us are foreign short of grace, and maybe we, all of us, we are invited to reflect and to work together and journey together, embracing this gospel of Utu. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next time, you will give us a whole morning. Uh, but thank you very much. I think faith uh, incites a lot of good, a lot of good reaction, and uh, that that for me is very, very, uh, uh, it, it's very useful. I finished by saying uh, that the conversation is about Utu. I know he talked about Genesis, but the, even in Genesis, the summary of all this that we talk about is this one lesson that we are supposed to carry as mankind about love God first with all your heart and then love your neighbor because then it will summarize uh, all these things that we are wrestling about. Thank you, Father, for uh, touching uh, three areas about many churches. Um, and uh, because, yes, uh, I, I'll not repeat that one. But I'll give you a surprise, uh, my brother. Is it Masese? Masese, many people who are in church are even younger than you. You'll be shocked. I didn't want to just respond, but if you actually assess, you need to walk into churches today. And that's why I didn't say they are coming because of me. I'm just responding because you see you answer. Yeah, so, so I'm just responding so that we can have some, some real good facts. That people come because of the Lord. And that's what we direct people to. That's why when I said, I, I said a question that they keep coming. I also said, I also sometimes don't know why they come. Didn't I pose it that way? But then, because, we are, because there is a greater power, I think somebody alluded to it, that draws people, because it's God who draws people to himself. It's not a human being. He uses a human being as an avenue uh, of that grace and of that power and, the, uh, and of that conduit. And I think that's what I was trying to allude to, the power of this uh, institution that uh, for us we say Christ died for and Christ defended. And as I finish, even if you look at church history, we, don't, we haven't seen anything worse than what was there in the Reformation. In fact, the Lord has, has used this opportunity to, to actually give hope. And today, I want to assure you that a lot of us have hope. In fact, you're sitting here because of the little hope you got on Sunday. And I think you're going to go and get back more of it. For those of you who have not been uh, coming for the doors on Sunday, please do come. And Sheila, you've said a great thing, that there are opportunities from children, uh, youth, that the church can uh, actually do. I want to attest that we, as the, basically in my diocese, which is the All Saints Cathedral Diocese, we put in a lot of resource in terms of the children uh, space. 
uh, just our three congregations, including mine, are putting up children's centers because we've realized that uh, uh, I feel what Sheila is feeling. Boaz, you know when he says that you give, you give up, sometimes, uh, you remember I said that sometimes you're asking, am I even making impact? And we realize that maybe where we must begin is the thing that even the Bible says, teach a child the way he should go. When he grows up, he will follow the correct way. And I think that's where even the missionaries got it. Because that's why when they came, they built bigger schools but small chapels. If you look at the missionary schools, because they used the classroom to instill value. They used the classroom to transmit faith. Uh, we actually know that we, the rain began to beat us. Uh, uh, the Catholics got it a little better because they stuck to, the, to their schools. Uh, we gave up the schools, possibly because the Anglicans were the government, so they assumed they're part of government, and then we gave up our rights, and then government took over. And so those are some of the debates that we are having. Uh, because you actually, if you're going to instill values, faith, the way even the missionaries, the, the way they did it is by having the school because you've got uh, to, um, to instill this faith. So we, I agree there's a lot of opportunity there and that we can actually uh, uh, take it and make progress. And lastly, I think somebody said values are caught and they are not taught. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll probably just wind up this session by saying, you know, what Uraya is also doing. Um, we have changed strategy. Uh, just like Sheila, you said, for us, we are a bit hopeful. We are looking at the young people who will be voting in 2027. So we are intervening from 13 year olds. Yeah, those will be 18 at that point. Hopefully, they can get their IDs on time to be able to go and vote. Uh, we are doing a lot of work uh, on civic education with schools. Actually, we are starting to work with the drama and music festivals. Uh, as of next year, I think we will be supporting the cup or a trophy on, on, on Utu or, or, or one of the areas uh, on civic education. We are also working with young people on NRG radio. Uh, just is it today, tomorrow and Saturday, we have what we call campus jams. And so Vibes Radio tomorrow will be at Multimedia University. Last week they were at USIU. So we hope that our partners can also support us more into taking this message to the ground, yeah? And then uh, we are also working, I think we work a lot with Ghetto Radio. We are also working with NRG Radio so that we just try to understand how youth want to be, to be reached because I know in terms of voter apathy uh, in 2022, we experienced uh, a, a huge voter apathy and we have to address it. I think I want to wind up with what the Sheikh said on behalf of all my speakers, that you have your hand, you have your tongue, and you have your heart. So you need to use one of them. And I know in the morning, our discussion with Dr. Mwangola, um, Dr. Mshai, was about the imperative, what we really need to do now. So I think all of us, we can use one of those organs to make this discussion go. So please clap for my panelists. <laughs> and thank you very much for your patience and for your engagement in the afternoon. God bless you. So let me call upon my colleague, uh, Alois, to Give us a summary of our discussions as we wind up the day. Thank you very much. Good evening. Mm. So we are heading to the last session where we'll be talking about the summary of the day. But before that, there is a question here which we can ponder about as we go home. It has been sent by one participant. Who is protecting or guarding the family unit? Since the church is marred by the trust issues from the public, the family unit is the foundation for propagating values. 
So she's asking who is protecting or guarding the family unit. We are talking about the church, we are complaining, we are complaining about schools and all the others. So who will protect the family? So that one we are not answering now. Then, due to the spirit of devolution, so I'm going to devolve this session and I'll invite our Uraia County Coordinator for NAROC, Ramadan Shaban. Ramadan, please come forward. He's the one who will do for us the summary. So Ramadan Shaban is the Uraia County Coordinator for NAROC County. He's a human rights defender. He's the chair of the Interfaith Youth Network in Narok. He's also the youth leader, Supreme Council of Muslim, Narok County. So welcome, Shaban. Thank you very much, Mr. Moy. Okay. Just a minute, there is something which will play before Ramadan continue. Okay, so Ramadan can do the summary, then we'll play the video. Okay, good evening. It has been a two days of interactive session uh, in, this co in this convention of CSOs. And I believe uh, when we get out of here, uh, we will all be energized, or rather energized, to go and uh, make sure that the values and Utu uh, Utu message has been taken across. So I'm here today to give you a, su a summary uh, of the day. And uh, the summary of today, we started by the imperative of Utu in realizing nationalhood. And we started by our very own chair, uh, Dr. Mshai, uh, whereby we had a very interactive session. Uh, she is a very good storyteller. You remember the story concerning Mekatilili Wamenza? Uh, the story concerning the women from Kisi and all the women uh, who fought for what we have today and the other allies who we have. Uh, the Utu, then we wanted to know uh, w what about Utu? What is Utu? And uh, what is Kenya? We wanted to know what is Utu and what is Kenya? And you as a Kenyan, who are you? What is your identity? And uh, we came and uh, concluded that Utu is not a new social contract. It has been with us. And uh, from the very own word of uh, our very own uh, chairperson, 
ofuraia eh, madam mshai and therefore eh, he said that utu revolved about culture and basically article 11 of the constitution and it has always been there we've we've always had our culture even before before even uh, the colonial we had our culture and we had our culture as africans and also utu revolves about integrity and humanity and she said and i quote i believe you are the one who quoted thomas sangara that you cannot carry out fundamental change without a certain amount of madness like for example you can see for us to achieve this constitution 2020, 2010 there were a lot of madness in between from uh, 1964 up to 2010 uh, we have people like uh, uh, pastor Njoya, who went through a lot we have people like martin shikuku so even in realizing utu and in attaining utu there must be some uh, degree of madness uh, and we are beginning it today because we said utu is a journey and just as uraia started in 2000 uh, we started as uh, because kenyans have rights that is in 2000 up to two, two, 2010 and then now we have because kenyans have rights and responsibility yeah you have your rights but you have responsibility and that responsibility is enshrined under article 10 of the constitution we have a responsibility you know article 10 is the engine of this constitution or rather we can say it's the heart of the constitution because it carries a lot uh, you can see in article 10 of the constitution you start with patrioti pat pat patriotism you as a kenyan are you proud being a kenyan our national unity we as Kenyans, sisi wote pamoja. And then sharing of devolution, the rule of law, kufuata sharia, and all that up to sustain development and uh, integrity and accountability. Uh, then we had the issue and the story of the elephant. Now, she was describing Utu. Utu was likened to an elephant, ambaye meekwa ndani ya room, then people ambao walikuwa blindfolded wakaingia kila mtu anaguza huyu akasema hii ni miti mwingine akasema hapana hii ni nyoka so that is all about the recap of uh, today uh, according to that session by dr dr mshai then we came to mr awori achoka uh, the kenya national integrity alliance and uh, he he was talking about utu and nationalhood and the story of the shrines we have the forest related with the Maasai, the lakes with the Luo, uh, the Njurinjeke in Meru, they have their own shrine. So the aspect of culture and the issue of all humans are equal and dignified before God and should be treated justly and equally. Uh, then we have the issue of respect and value, humanity and, dig and dignity, and we had the famous uh, phrase of I am because, I am because, because we are, oh, so you know when you come out of here, uh, we want you to pass the message because to meanza, to nataka, to kue nai, because Kenyans have rights and responsibility. Alafu hili alisema ya 2030. Muna ikumbuka? What do we want to achieve by 2030? Utu. And what was the phrase ambaye tulukua tume coin about uh, Utu on 2030? Because Kenyans have Utu. Okay. So, I don't want to dwell that. Alafu, kuna ile saying ya kiswaili ambaye ilisemekana, afadhali utu kuliko? Afadhali utu kuliko? Oh, you know, today was very interactive. Even the day was very short. Hata imeisha. Masiku imeisha. So, then we, ha we went to the second session, ambaye ilikuwa ni about uh, the progress, national values as and principle as a whole. And the progress has she been realizing of national value, uh, we had uh, a representative from the private sector, and uh, we have the youths. Uh, we had that gentleman from Kwacha. Uh, we had uh, uh, Madam Patience Nyange from uh, Association of w Media Women in Kenya, and we had the role of the media in enhancing Utu. Uh, we had Joshua from Kreko, and uh, Joshua really mm, pricked our minds. You are civil society. You are civil society. Uh, do you, Nini do an advocate for Utu? Are you yourself adhering to the Utu? How do you conduct your election? 
are you corrupt or not? So all of that, it was around nine fundamental questions that you, because it begins with me, now you as a civil society, let it begin with you. Ask yourself, are you all that? Then we had uh, uh, at the Directorate of National Cohesion and Values, and uh, he spoke about uh, the survey they conducted concerning, concerning the national values and principle. And uh, Article 132 of the Constitution concerning the state of, uh, the, state of the nation by the president, uh, which uh, brewed uh, heated debate and concerning that uh, the president normally go to give the state of the nation just like kama siku ya madaraka wakati wanaenda kupiga siyasa. And the issue ya state of the nation is a very serious issue that you need to discuss fundamental issues that affect Kenyans in matters security, in matters development, and uh, 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 values and principle. Then we had somebody from the Office of Re Registrar of Political Parties and I remember he said that they disburse the funds where to, to those parties that are there to the values and principle, or rather at, subscribe to Article 10 of the Constitution. And I was wondering, and I wanted to ask in the morning, uh, you know, most counties, most counties, most county assemblies, they have not uh, uh, attained the issue of inclusivity concerning the person with disability. You will find that the Constitution and Article 177 state that uh, the person with disability are supposed to be nominated under the, politi under the party list. But what does uh, the Registrar of Political Party does about that? Uh, we would like to hear, we would like to know later. Then, uh, there seems to be a missing link between the old and the young. There seems to be a missing link between the old and the young. And then what are we going to do now in the issue of value? Are we happy in the civil society? Are you happy in the civil society? Or there is issue of indiv individualism and materialism in this country? Then we, had the, we, we went in the afternoon session and we had the transformative education uh, uh, session whereby we had Dr. Sheila and uh, Boaz Waruku, who is the founding chair of Uraia, and we were, they were speaking about transformative in education. Uh, in our, is our education value based? Uh, education system, is it for market? Does it mold responsible citizen? Or rather, the education system that we have is only for marketing. Uh, unataka usome wendo upate kazi. Uh, does it mold your values, you as a citizen? Mutu wakipitia ni system ya education. Je, unatoka ukiwa transformed, do you realize? And that's why kwa hii discussion sa hii tuliongea kuhusu mambo ya CBC and the need to inculcate values kwa hii curriculum ya, CV, ya CBC. Then, kuna mambo ya positive and negative values and the universal, the universal, universal values which are, which are positive should be, which are positive uh, should be propagated. Then, the issue of discipline in school and uh, Dr. Sheila, I believe, talked about uh, uh, punishment in schools. And uh, you, as you can see, ukienda kwa forums, watu wana, wana zungumza, wanasema watoto wetu sikuizi wanachoma shule, wanakosa discipline, kwa sababu, uh, corporal punishment, according to Article 29, wakati Constitution 2010 was, uh, was uh, promulgated, mambo ya corporal punishment iliisha kwa shule, punishing children iliisha, kwa sababu Article 29 of the Constitution inazungumzia kuhusu freedom and security of person. Aufai kupanishi. Iyo mambo ya kupiga watoto na pipe, spanking, pinching, iyo yote. So, and Dr. Sheila was talking about that. And uh, tukakuja maneno ya constitutional values missing in the CBC. Uh, we need to take advantage of the reform through working groups. Okay. We need to take uh, advantage of the working group in the CBC and the uni in universal acceptable positive value in the education to, to differentiate between uh, rights and we need to have a conducive friendly environment. And finally, tumetoka tu hapa hivi kwa issue concerning faith, the role of faith, and I'm not going to deal about that because it is still fresh in our mind. Thank you very much because of time. Thank you. Trust, the civic engagement unit, 
works with citizens, both at the county and national level, to promote participation in governance processes, ensuring that they engage with their government at the county level and also the national government units. So we work with them through looking at issue of engagement in public participation processes which are at county level, looking at the budgets, looking at the planning, looking at CIDP, that is the County Integrated Development Plan, working towards ensuring that they participate in annual development plans. And also we work together with the citizen formations and group to ensure that they engage in holding leaders accountable and also monitoring service delivery. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sorry. <coughs> Thank you, everyone, for today. Thank you for attending day two and for being part of these um, sessions that we've participated in today. There were so many questions, and uh, we didn't have enough time. I hope tomorrow we are able to come in early. Maybe we can have a short session of recap, and people can continue asking some questions that are pending. Um, uh, I would like to bring to our attention tomorrow's theme so that at least it can entice you to come early. It is an interesting topic. Tomorrow, day three, we are going to be discussing UTU, an inclusive approach to end violence against women, girls, and persons with disabilities. So please, let's come early tomorrow. The session is supposed to start at nine. Um, if we get here late, then we start late and it will be really prudent for us to start uh, exercising UTU, okay? We are talking about UTU and values. We need to start doing that. It starts with us. So let's try and come in early tomorrow so that we start on time. We still have time. We have about 20 minutes to have tea. So we are going into the session of tea break, and um, as we do that, I would request us to rise on our feet so that we close with a word of prayer because we started with a word of prayer. Um, I had a request from the executive director earlier today. Um, uh, there is one participant who uh, really had an interesting um, a story about her community, uh, one Lea Chebet, who would have easily told us uh, how the Pokot community really lived in Utu and, the, uh, and that concept. And so because there is no time Lea left, tomorrow morning um, I would request you to come in early so then you can give us four to three minutes of uh, the community of Pokot's way of doing Utu. Is that all right? Thank you. I will do that tomorrow, Mr. Executive Director. So let's rise and uh, pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for this day that you have given us. Thank you because you've led us and you have taught us. Thank you because we have listened to your voice through your speakers that you brought in today. We want to pray that everything that we have heard and discussed, we may go away pondering and really thinking around and about this. We pray that, Jehovah, everything that we have said that is not pleasing to you, you may forgive us. And everything that we have said and we do not have an answer to, help us to get answers so that we are able to steer this nation into the right direction. As we live today, we pray for protection, we pray for journey masses, and we pray for your coverage. Bless the tea that we are going to have and let it nourish our souls. In Jesus' name I pray, believing and trusting. Amen. Have a lovely evening and see you tomorrow. Please, all, come back tomorrow. Don't miss tomorrow's sessions.